Clint Barmas, but that accounted for all of their scoring as they were beaten by the Mets 7 to 3. Todd Helton sat last night. Helton, who has the 12th highest on base percentage in Major League history, will be in the three hole playing first base for the Rockies, who are the wild card leaders in the National League by one game over the Giants. Well, Mike has had five starts in July. Three of them have been outstanding, seven innings or more, but two of them have been quite unmentionable as he tries to put together two in a row with that seven and six record. 39 walks and 110 innings pitched. And the Lexus Metsy defense, and you know, you're not going to change a winning combination. The only changes, and you can see Castillo staying healthy this year, 83rd start. Last season, he only started 78. The only change in the lineup is uh, Brian Schneider. They've been platooned there with Santos, but Jerry's going to stay with this core right now. It's been playing well. Jerry Manuel said something very interesting before the game today. He said, one of my faults as a manager has often been that I try and mix things up. And sometimes, because I do that, I don't get the consistency that I want to. So here he is staying with a consistent lineup because, well, it's been working. Well, I think it's very interesting. Just like his first two hitters, it's almost like a rote lineup for these players. They know what they have to do every single night. They're going to be penciled in. They come ready to fulfill their roles. And fulfilling their roles they have been. 29 runs in the last four games. And they'll try and keep it rolling tonight against a good team, the Colorado Rockies, who were mired in late May and have been brilliant over the last two months under their new manager Jim Tracy. The rookie center fielder Dexter Fowler will lead things off. Fowler hitting at 253. He's walked 52 times this year which is um, something that has been a painful development at times for him. And the first pitch from Pelfrey is taken high for ball one. Oh, he's a long-legged kid. He can fly and he can play a little center field. I see him bat from the left side. He batted right-handed last night. The switch hitter. And bluffing a bunt takes a fastball for a strike, one and one. Well, I think the, to equate him to another player, the Florida Marlins would have loved if Cameron Maybin had played the way Fowler has done so far this year as Smith on deck. Says Smith and then Todd Helton here in the first. As Pelfrey misses low with the sinker, two and one. 73 home runs in this Colorado Rocky lineup tonight. This is a much more powerful lineup against right-handers than left. Yeah, Fowler cuts and misses at the sinker, two and two. Mike Pelfrey's had a history of some success against the Rockies. Last year, pitched eight shutout innings against them right before the All-Star break at Shea. In fact, he's gone 13 and two-thirds consecutive scoreless against Colorado his last two starts. And he gets Fowler as he threw that ball by Dexter Fowler at 96 miles an hour. That's the first out of the night. Well, I think this is a simple case of just overmatched. When you go up in that batter's box, of course, you're looking for the ball down from Pelfrey, threw that good four-seamer up in the strike zone and beat him. So one out and nobody on. Now Seth Smith, who pinch hit last night. Smith was the opening day left fielder for the Rockies and has started a little less than half their games, hitting a 291 on the year. A valued pinch hitter when he doesn't play. And he takes a strike from Belfry, who is trying to negotiate a first inning, which has often been the big bugaboo for Mike. 34 hits he's allowed in the first inning this year in 19 starts. That's the most in the major leagues. To let you folks out there know what that means, the first inning should be your best inning. That should be an inning really where you really have an advantage because they're seeing you for the first time. Even if you're pitching against a team like Philadelphia, usually that's the inning that you should dominate. And yet so many pitchers don't. Ripped into right field, a base hit for Smith. That'll go to the corner. Frank Kerr back to play it, and Smith easily into second base with a one-out double. Eighth double of the year for Seth Smith. Well, this ball's ripped. Wants the fastball away. Too much of the middle and up, Ronnie. Not much sink. But had it away enough where he wasn't hurt with the long ball. And let's see where the location is. Corner while too much outer half. Full extension of the hands. The arms, excuse me. You can't fully extend the hands. <laughs> Unless you're Inspector Gadget. Well, if you open your fist. Edward Scissorhands. <laughs> there you go. Here's Todd Helton, now 35 years old. 
near the 2,000 hit plateau earlier this year. Lifetime 328 hitter. And Helton takes low ball one. Helton has a 427 career on base percentage. And just to put that in perspective, that is the 12th highest of all time, but he has more home runs than all but five of the guys who are ahead of him. So he's been a guy who's gotten on base and hit for power. I a think less power in the last few years. I think a lot of that, I'm not taking anything away from Todd. Todd is one of the best hitters ever to play the game. He's played 81 games in Colorado each season where the ball jumps, but he is really a fine, disciplined hitter. So what you're saying, Chief, is that he would be the same fine hitter he is if he played another ballpark, but the power numbers would be diminished. Well, I think the home run numbers would be. It'd have to be. But he's a line drive hitter. Yeah. I don't think it would affect him. And I think at this point in his career, the power numbers wouldn't change because, frankly, he's not a home run hitter anymore. He's at 11 this year. Swinging 3-0 and he fouls it off. Well, he only hit seven home runs last year. It was a big drop-off in his power. And, boy, he's turned that around. He's got 10 homers and hitting 328 against right-handers this season. Milton with 321 career home runs. By the way, some perspective on the on-base percentage number. He's at 427. The all-time record is Ted Williams, 482. Babe Ruth is second at 474. And there's ball four to Helton, and the Rockies have two men on. I don't think Pelfrey wanted anything to do with Helton right there, but you always you can get yourself in trouble. You've got two men on base now. I know you're looking for a double play, but you've got a pretty tough hitter right here in Brad, in, uh, Brad Hopp. Here are some of those first inning numbers on Pelfrey. 386 batting average against in the first inning. After the first inning, the batting average against is just 261. You know, the problem has been, though, is that that... that thing that he could always rely on the double play ball has not been happening for him no double plays in his last four starts Brad hop the batter and the Rockies all-star right fielder takes ball one so Keith you said he didn't want any part of Helton and that's a way to go I think at this point in their careers Brad hop is a better hitter probably than than Todd Helton well he's also hitting 339 against righties with 11 bombs too so and big cut by Hop at the fastball, one and one. In this situation right here, I know Hop's got a lot of power. You've got a sinker ball pitcher, and that's what you're going to get. And see, he's trying to lift that sinker and pull it. And you're playing right into a right hand sinker baller's hands. He, Pelfrey wants you to roll over, hit the double play, pull. That left center field gap on a sinker outside is very inviting, at least to me. Troy Tulowitzki has been red hot on deck, and Hop takes a fastball right on the inside edge. Good pitch by Pelfrey, one and two. It's an excellent pitch by Pelf, and this is what he has to do against left-handers, Ron. Throw that dart in there for a strike. You know what he needs to do even more, Keith? He needs to double up there occasionally. Usually he throws one in there and then goes strictly away. Double up in there. You're ahead of the count. And Schneider moves inside, and it's on the inside corner. Strike three call. A recipe for success as Pelfrey comes inside to get hot for the second out of the inning. Well, if you were a hitter, Keith, you wouldn't like this pitch being called a strike. A little inside, maybe comes back a little. See Schneider with that little gentle move of the ball. Two seamers, his ball, his hand is right on the seam. And a big out. Let's see here. Inside. You know, I never understand. Look at the umpire. He's looking right over that inside corner. Larry Vanover is the home plate umpire, but you see how far to the right he is, so he's seeing that inside corner as being the inside edge of the batter's box. Like that ball is punching him in the mask, and when it does, he calls it a strike. That's Troy Tulowitzki with two out and two on. Tulowitzki had a really good night at the plate last night, on base four straight times, and a long home run to center field. And Ronnie mentioned last night, Tulowitzki, they altered his stance, standing more straight up, more power. He was more crouched, bent at the waist. Now he's much more straight up as a hitter. That's a little toe top he does now, too. Grounds one. Cora. Side retire. Pelfrey gives up a hit and a walk, but a couple of strikeouts up. Get him through the inning. No score.
Got traded to the Giants. There you go. Brian Schneider, the only change in the lineup. Luis Castillo, as hot as you can get right now, four straight multiple hit games, and hitting over 400 in the month of July. And facing off against Jason Marquis. Well, having a career year, 12 and 6. I mentioned before his highest win total was in 2004 with the Cardinals when he won 15 ball games. But he has been so dependable and really has taken the role as their, if they're not number one starter, they're number one A with Aaron Cook. Angel Pagan leads things off. Pagan had his eight-game hitting streak stopped last night. Batting average dropped below 300 to 297. A rare offer for Mr. Pagan, who's been spectacular in the leadoff spot. Yeah, and a fastball strike for Marquis, one and two. And Luis Castillo on deck, and then David Wright in the opening inning. These two guys at the top of the order, Pagan and Castillo, have been doing a great job setting the table early. You know, many times the Met hitters under Howard Johnson want to dictate the at-bats against Marquis. You're not going to be able to do that because he throws strikes, throws the ball over the plate. He wants you to put the ball in play, so you're going to have to be aggressive. On the inside corner, strike three called. Same pitch Pelfrey got. Nails Pagan for the first out. Didn't get a lot of that inside corner. He's got a lot of plate here, but the fact that it starts out on the inside corner, that's yeah, got a lot of the middle. That just fooled Pagan. Inner half. See the fanny fly out, you're dead when you do that. I'm allowed to say Fanny, right? You can, but Although, you have to do the defense. Oh, now. four defense, excuse me. Three time gold glover, Todd Helton over there at first base. And he's wearing number 17. He said, You could pick it when you wore that number two. <laughs> you can say anything you want, Keith, once. <laughs> Castillo hitting 455 over his last 17 games. And he slices one foul, one and one. Louis with four straight multiple hit games. First time he's done that. Since July of 2004, five years ago. And isn't that a great sign? 1 0 to Louie, and he swings at that pitch. That's a pitch that he almost always would take when he's struggling. Here's a fastball for a strike, 1 and 2. I don't think Marquis has thrown a ball over the knees yet. Marquis is a guy that throws strikes. Now home. remember that Marquis was questionable yeah. tonight because of a blister that caused him to skip a turn. Popped up into shallow left. Ronnie, you talked to Smith grabs it for the second half. You talked to him before the game, Jason, around about his blister? Yeah, and he said that the problem he was having, really, is you look at the motion, very simple. If you want to copy this at all, kids, this is a very simple motion. Knee to the hands, separate, and let the ball fly. He said what happened in his last start, and he missed the start in between, is that he had to change the grip on his change up and his fastball because it was rubbing against the blister but now with this 10 days rest his blister feels much better and he's been able to go back to his old grip and he looks very strong here early in the game well that blister couldn't have hurt him too bad he pitched a heck of a ball game against the uh, Padres he beat him David Wright takes low and away well Marquis said the blister first started uh, affecting him in the middle of June so he had been nursing it for about a month and a half before finally having to, having to sit out that last start Two and out to right. Larry Vanover calling the balls and strikes tonight. Sam Holbrook, Dan Iasonia, and the crew chief Charlie Rutherford rounding out the crew. Two and out to David, and he fouls one away. You never know where you're going to find the names of the umpires, right? It could be anywhere. It's like with Sell, Rutherford, and um, hold off, I'll hold on Vanover. <laughs> They are. These umps, they love to. Uh, oh, nice slider. It's funny, right? With Charlie Relaford on third base with the glasses. In our day, I don't care if umpire couldn't see, he would never wear glasses because of the ribbing he would take from the benches. So much has changed. 2 2 to right, and he punches one into center field for a base hit. Well, the Mets with a two out base runner, David Wright's 118th hit of the year. Well, Dave is starting to swing the bat better here. Tries to come inside and up with two strikes. Nicely done. There's David's tap with his front foot. It's almost like the old David, huh? 
He comes in, the, comes in with his hands a little bit, got beat inside, but able to get the bat through, the barrel of the bat through. Tonight, Daniel Murphy, his fourth straight game in the cleanup spot, and as Jerry Manuel will explain tonight, he's not exactly a cleanup hitter. But what he is, he's a left-handed bat to hit between right and Frank Cora. My favorite with Jerry before the game, Keith, is that he had Murphy up in that big shot with the guys in first and second. He let him swing the bat. He said, when I saw the first swing, then I put the bunt on. Did not like the swing. Right takes off. Ionetta with the throw. One hop and a good tag put down by Tulowitzki to end the inning. Right caught stealing, two to six. Ninth time David's been thrown out this year. And the Mets are done in the bottom of the first. Mike Pelfrey back to the mound. No score. Mike Pelfrey gets set to face the Rockies in the second inning. It'll be Ian Stewart, Chris Iannetta, and Clint Varmus to bat. Seventeen bombs. Thirteen against right-handers. Stewart 0 for 4 last night. Looked a little uncomfortable against the left-handers. And he took high and inside for ball one. Kind of a hit or miss kind of hitter to me. He's got a real Ruthian kind of swing. Yeah, the guy stands upright, hands high, almost like, no, not quite like Yaz. I was thinking maybe uh, uh, Mike Jacobs, you know, someone like that. Real power kind of stance. He's got that little foam, the red thing on his thumb. That's the. Per that's the protect. He's probably got a sore thumb right now. That's called the Hanya pad. Remember that? They used to call the what? that the Hanya pad. What does that mean? Because the first time you enter it, you go, Hanya. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yes. <laughs> I feel like Dick Martin there. <laughs> <laughs> Two and one to Stewart, the Colorado third baseman. And he takes the big Ruthian hack, and it's two and two. By the way, you invoked Mike Jacobs. What happened to him? Yeah. Did he fall off the Oh, well, he went to club? Kansas City, but he's just had a horrid year. You know, as a sleeper player for those Kansas City Royals, uh, Tehan, Mark Tehan, yeah. he is a good hitter. And when exactly do you see them play? Never. Um, the only reason I know Tehan is I saw him play in AAA in Sacramento. You know how a guy plays and you go, boy, that kid really knows yeah, someone, how to hit, you know? Yeah, someone gets your eye. And then he, you see him four or five years later, you see his stats, and you go, boy, that was one of the few people I was right about. 3-2 to Stewart is high ball four, so Pelfrey issues his second walk of the night. 
A leadoff walk in the second inning. Runs inside pitch on Mike Pelfrey. Part of the business of baseball brought to you by Xerox. Ready for real business. Well, if you're a Colorado Rocky hitter, that's what you have to look up, Pelfrey. His best pitch is going to be a sinker now with Stewart on. He's very uneasy right now with the running game. He's got a little bit of anxiety when he pitches from the stretch. And you have to lay off his slider until he proves to you that he can throw it for a strike. And he hasn't yet. Chris Ionetta hitting seventh in the order. Rockies catcher is hitting just 199 against right-handed pitching this year. But he's been getting the ball to the playing time ahead of your beat Tori Alba. And it's hit on one hop to Cora. Should be an easy double play. Castillo with the turn, two men down. So after Pelfrey had failed to generate a ground ball double play through his last four starts, he gets one in the second inning tonight. Well, this is called Jam City. And you can see him trying to bring his, his right arm into his body to get the barrel through, but that ball just too much velocity and too much inside, and that bat is going to the mash unit. You always don't mind a bat going down like this. You can see you're almost on the label. On the label. You don't mind a bat going down if it has a base hit in it, and particularly with an RBI in it, too. Dying a hero? Yes. <laughs> Clint Barmas cracked out of a large 0 for last night with a home run, just one for his last 24, hitting eighth in the order against the right hander tonight, and Pelfrey gets ahead of him 0 2. You guys are on the road trip. I haven't seen Pelfrey throw this hard in a while. Well, he's throwing more for seeing fastballs. And he's talking to himself again. He's always out there. He's very intent. I was out at lunch today and a gentleman came over to me that was a sports psychologist. Oh boy. By the time he had left, he had scared me to death. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're not supposed to be like that, right? It's supposed to be a, a, a good moment. Did he want to help? Oh, and Barmas gets blown away by Pelfrey. Third strikeout for Mike. Mm -hmm. An impressive inning after the leadoff walk. That's a lot. Murphy, Frank Kerr, and Sullivan coming up at the bottom of the second. The view from the Acela Club. Out in right in the left field. No score at City Field. Field. Get to City Field, the Mets' new home of amazing as the series with the Rockies continues tomorrow night at 7.10 p.m. Visit Mets.com or call 718-507-TIXX for your tickets now. You see the westerly winds. Daniel Murphy leads off in the home second inning, and he rips one over the bag and down the line for an extra base hit. It'll go into the deep corner. 
And by the time Hop picks it up, Murphy easily stands at second base with a leadoff double. 16th double of the year for Daniel Murphy. Well, Dan has been kind of turned on that inside pitch a little more lately. Nicely done. Mets are in business. I think that's, Keith, why we saw last night that the defense for the Rockies was playing Daniel Murphy much more straight up and not to left center field because he has been trying to consciously pull early in the count. And that was a mistake by Marquis. You saw the catcher back there. Ionetta set up outside. So now Frank Curry, who homered yesterday, his third as a man and his eighth this year, and he takes low and away ball one. Well, he wants it away, and guess what? That had a lot of plate, too. Oh, you know what? That's cripple hitting. you got to jump on those cripple pitches. That's baseball parlance, folks. No offense intended. Is that what you're yes. trying to say? Yes. And Frank Curran lines a base hit in the right center field. Murphy turns third and heads on in. It's an RBI single for Jeff Frank Curran. It's 1-0 New York. He just keeps on driving him in. That's 16 RBIs in 14 games for Jeff Frank Burke. Well, he has just been on a tear. Another pitch down the middle, but the pitch he could have pulled, and Frank Cora set up a way to either drive in or advance the runner. Nicely done, beautiful, hitting it right up at the plate, right there on the pitch out over the plate, beautiful. You know, it's one of, to me, one of the big surprises in watching Jeff Frank Cora because you look at his aggressiveness and you think of him as a pull hitter. But if you look at the direction of his base hits this year, he has as many hits to right as he does to left. Now Corey Sullivan's still nobody out, and he takes ball one. In fact, his first hit as a Met was to right field. But remember in last night's ball game, runners on first and second, he plated that big run with that fly ball to right center field. It moved right over Sullivan with the sacrifice fly. Those little things that Frank Cora doing, is doing, not only bringing energy to this team, but that's winning baseball. Well, he's getting the big RBIs right now. He's driving in the runs. He has driven in more runs than he's in games played since being on the Met uniform, and that's key. The Mets have not had that guy that's been driving in runs consistently, and Frank Cora has taken that, the lead in that. It's been a wonderful symbiotic relationship. He has helped the Mets, and the Mets have helped him. Take it for a strike by Sullivan, 2-1, and one. and by that I mean he has brought... Uh, energy and enthusiasm to this team which I think the team is fed off and I think the change of scenery and the way he's been welcomed here has helped him at least for the moment turn his season around. That Mets uniform has almost become a defibrillator for him hasn't it? Yep. 16 RBI in 14 games that's outstanding. Two and one to the former Rocky Sullivan who hits a double play ball right to Tulowitzki and Barmas with the turn for the 6-4-3 double play. So two out and nobody on. Brian Schneider coming up. Let's check in with Kevin Burkhardt. Kevin? Oh, guys, just a couple things to add to your conversation on Frank Coeur and his enthusiasm. And, and, and you know, in the postgame, he, he loves, uh, you know, dealing with the media. And it's taken a, a lot of pressure off of especially David Wright. And he's had some great quotes. And, and he's, he's really off to a great start with, with everything. And I think the other thing is you talk about him at the plate. In yesterday's game, in the inning that Corey Sullivan hit the sack fly to tie it, remember he had the ball to right that advanced the runners. He said he wouldn't be able to do that two weeks ago, and I think it's a combination of A, new place, his mind is a lot freer, and B, you know, Hojo has done a couple of those little things to change his stance where he feels now he's more comfortable uh, going that way and doing the little things. Well, it's always great to get a new atmosphere when you're kind of going, you're stagnant, going stale. Or, uh, in, the, op the team you played for before you've been traded and it's either I've always felt you either get off hot or you don't get off or, or, or you stay mired and in Frank Cora's case he is just it's like a new season for him and for whatever reason just his personality when I'm around him this is the kind of town that's not for everybody seems to feed off the energy here unbelievably so Right. Schneider pops one up in foul ground. Tough angle for Helton. Barmas over. They collide. And somebody caught that ball. Helton. Helton was able to hang on to it to end the inning. Daniel Murphy's double sets it up for the Mets. Jeff Frank Kerr brings him around.
Jeff Francoeur's RBI single has the Mets in front of the Rockies. Earlier today, Jeff Wilpon, the team's COO, meeting the media and trying to set right what happened here yesterday at City Field. And he made two things very, very clear. A, that he was very sorry to Adam Rubin, and B, that Omar Minaya was dead wrong. We're very sorry about what happened yesterday. It was the wrong forum, the wrong time, a wrong situation for Omar to express himself in that way. He's, I have a call in to Adam right now to apologize on behalf of myself, the organization, ownership, and I know uh, I'm going to ask him if he'll accept the call from Omar. Omar would very much like to call him and apologize for the venue that uh, he took to embarrass him and talk to him in that manner. And uh, I'm hoping Adam will accept that phone call, and I hope he accepts my phone call and the apology from the organization. Reprimanded? No, he hasn't been reprimanded. I mean, I think his remorse and what he's shown is his his sorrow for this and, and what he knows he did. You know, the collateral damage it caused me, the collateral damage it caused my father, my uncle, the organization as a whole, he feels bad for. And, and I think that's that's more punishment than anybody could ever put what, on him. Yeah, what, Omar's our general manager. Omar's going to be our general manager. Oh, guys, clearly ownership was just as shocked as really everyone else was watching this unfold. But uh, please know, Jeff did go on to say that, look, Omar is our GM. He will be our GM. And while he felt the team's image definitely took a hit, he felt that the team, and especially Omar, would recover. Guys? I think that's all um, true, and I think that's a great step by ownership today to you know, come out. And, and it, it seemed like a, a very heartfelt um, apology on Jeff's part, on the part of uh, himself and uh, the Wilpon family and, and the organization. I will say this, though. Um, no matter how much support the Wilpons throw behind Omar, and you can certainly understand that they're supporting him to be their GM for the long term, there's a very stern test coming for Omar when he comes out in front of the media again and tries to reestablish relationships that have been badly fractured by what happened yesterday. Well, the, he's definitely going to have to show some serious contrition, I think. I think that'll be what Omar will concentrate on as follow grounds out to Alex Cora. And I think he will show that. I mean, I, I was there when Jeff was having his uh, press conference or make-do press mm -hmm. conference, and it was. It was a heartfelt apology trying to right the situation. Listen, the organization took a hit yesterday. They're trying to rebound from that. And Jerry Manuel said it earlier today, the best thing that could evaporate all of this bad feeling is winning some baseball games, and they've been doing that of late. And, Ronnie, it wasn't just an image thing, because I asked Jeff, I said, hey, you know, in your eyes, did Adam Rubin do anything wrong? And he said no. So this was not uh, damage control. This was just uh, what they felt was right and wrong. Well, my feeling is, and I'll just put an end to it, is that the Mets did the right thing. Just put it to bed. And that's certainly what they hope will happen, that they can put this all behind them and, you know, the next, uh, the next move is up to Omar. Seth Smith is up with two out and nobody on. And Pelfrey falls behind him 2-0. and oh. Smith ripped a double to right field his first time up. And he takes a fastball for a strike, 2-1. and one. I just love when Mike Pelfrey can execute and come out here with a game plan that, you know what, my best pitch is my sinker, but to dominate a left-handed lineup, I need to pitch inside. And when he does that, it's just fun watching him pitch. Well, it's been a big part of his game so far tonight, and we had the generous inside corner from Larry Vanover. There's no reason to stop going there. Yes, keep pounding it in there until he stops calling. Seth Smith, former backup quarterback to Eli Manning at Ole Miss. Never that's, played there. That's a real backup. Well, that's way. why he chose baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a good career choice. On the inside corner, strike three call. And Smith knew it. You're not going to make a living tonight taking that pitch. Fourth strikeout for Mike Pelfrey. A one-two.
sometimes at night going back it can be a little problem. But uh, coming in to work on the 7 train, I'll tell you, is uh, interesting because when you come in, most people are just getting off of work. So they don't know who you are, don't care who you are. They got their iPod, they got their newspaper, and they can't wait to get home. Alex Cora leading off the home third. Alex oh. survived his meeting with the tarp last night. Remember, he went sliding hard into the tarp trying to chase a foul ball and stayed down for a moment. And everybody in the Mets dugout held their breath. Two and two to Alex. But he is one tough cookie. Jerry said that his play with a broken thumb, thumb ligaments, has been commendable. Toward the hole and a base hit for Cora. Right under Ian Stewart. And the Mets get the leadoff man on for the second straight inning. Well, now this goes the other way nicely, and he's been struggling. And Ronnie, you said it, he's got the bad the bad thumb. Nice to see him starting to swing the bat a little bit better. Well, when you're a Met hitter and you're facing Jason Marquis, same thing. His best pitch is his sinker, but he's also got a great change if that comes from the same spot as that sinker. And he can take away that bunning game sometimes because he is an outstanding athlete, quick to the ball. And Mike Belfry's bunt is fair. Ionetta will have to go to first. Mike was supposed to try to get out of the way, it looks like, but it works. For a 2 4 sacrifice. By the way, Ron's inside pitch on Jason Marquis, part of the business of baseball, brought to you by Xerox, ready for real business. Oh, that was almost shades of David Cohn and Candlestick Park, Ron. It was Atlee Hammerker, right? Yep. Just got his hand out of the way. Who did we see recently call one up the thing? Was that Kawakami in Atlanta? Yeah. Who uh, had his hand wrapped around the bat? That Could was, have really been injured. That was an oh, excuse me, sacrifice part. Well, once again, the Mets doing the little things. They're playing good fundies. So Pagan will try and get him in, and he drives one to left field, but Smith is there to pick it off, and now hustling back is Cora, and he dives in safely. Well, Pagan did exactly what he wanted, driving the ball to the opposite field, but Smith was there. Well, a little too much hang time, and it's also a big hang with him. He hit it good. Cora gets back. You hate to see him go back with that thumb. And you got to be careful because you know that Seth Smith can throw on the run. <laughs> well, we hear he can. <laughs> Never got a chance to show that off at all. This. It was pretty funny. They were saying the other night, Clayton Richard, who was a pitcher for the Chicago White Sox, former quarterback of Michigan, and they were saying this and that, and then finally gave his stats. Eight for 15 for 52 yards. And Castillo takes ball one. This was the little cutter on Louie right there. First at bat. And it got inside and jammed him. A little soft, lazy fly ball to left field. Good pitch by Marquis. Ionetta throwing behind Cora, and the ball hits him and rolls into no man's land, but Stewart backs it up. Got him on the back pocket, it looked like. Yeah, right in the tailbone for little Alex. Oh, right in the belt. No, oh, we've got him right in the middle. I've got a little bit of that lower spine. Got a little padding on it on the left and right side, but that got him right in the middle. By the way, if you're Corey, you're like Tulowitzki. I play short too. Come in front to catch that ball. So now Marquis behind 2 0 on Castillo. Jason Marquis, who began his year as a Brave, then a Cardinal, had up and down years in both places, two years in Chicago before going to the Rockies. And this, by all accounts, might be his best season. I was just thinking about that last play. It can be very sexy for a catcher to throw the ball around the bases. You never want to have your shortstop moving with Castillo at the plate to throw down there to second. You can't leave that shortstop position empty. And in order to make that play, does the shortstop have to be moving before the ball crosses the plate? He, he has to be edging that way. Yep. Absolutely. So if he's where he's at right now, Gary, if you can get a look from uh, Al's camera up top, he's too far away. He's too far away from second base to get there in time. He has to vacate a little bit. 
And that's a very dangerous thing with Castillo up because Castillo goes the other way. See, he's too far away. He has to kind of vacate. You see him kind of shuffling there. And that's all timing. He can get there, but it also, with the Castillo going the opposite field the way he does, that's a very risky thing to do. And you have your weight all on your left side, so you can never go to your right, even if you try to make the adjustment. 3-2 to Castillo, and he hits one back up the middle, a base hit, it hits the bag, and that'll bring Cora home. Castillo holds it first with an RBI single, and it's 2-0 New York. Everything Louis Castillo touches right now turns to gold. You're right. You know you're hot when you turn this diamond into a pinball. Well, he's hitting the ball on the ground. Another cutter, but not up and not in enough. Got in a little bit. I don't think they make this play. This ball goes through yeah. even if it, if it doesn't hit the bag. Oh, well, that's more fun this way. And there's the where, where he wants the catcher, wants it. And see, that's all it takes. That's the difference between on the barrel of the bat and in enough to jam a hitter. 25 RBIs now for Castillo. 10 for his last 17. Now David Wright. And David takes low for ball one. We'll see if Castillo thinks about trying to steal the base. Marquis has been very runnable this year. 10 out of 11 stolen base attempts with Marquis on the mound. David tried to steal one his first time up and was thrown out after he singled. Well, David back in the first inning got a single up the middle. And that's a fast spot. It's inside corner, RJ. Belt's high, but it just wanted to maybe get it up a little more. Upstairs a little more. But good hitting by David. That's not a bad pitch. And I was thinking about when we do the pitch, pitch differential. Louis Castillo, that was the same pitch from Jason Marquis. Just three or four inches difference from 60 feet, six inches. One was a pop-up to left field, and the other one's a base hit up the middle. That's how precise you have to be as a major league pitcher. Oh. Slider in for a strike, two and two. Ronnie, when you got a red-hot hitter up there, even though Castillo can't take you deep, yeah. uh, do you maybe, you're obviously you're aware of it, do you maybe press a little bit too much to make a perfect pitch? Right to Barmas, that'll end the inning. I think that, Keith, what happens is you will press a little bit, but when Louis is a single sitter, you have to go after him. Mets had a run. Two The 2 nothing lead. You see Daniel Murphy out at first base wearing Carlos Delgado's glove. Aha! Uh -huh. well, of course, Murph was an outfielder when the year began, so earlier today, Delgado out there taking some ground balls, working with Murphy at first. Carlos making his recovery from hip surgery and 
passes along some tips along the way. Carlos hopes to be back in the next two to three weeks. Todd Helton leads off and shoots one right up at the third base bag. A base hit for Helton. Sullivan to the line to play it, and he'll hold Helton, who is a very slow runner at this point in his career, to a single. Wow, that, you'd think that would have been a double. Nicely positioned by the Mets. And that's beautiful hitting right there on a pitch away. Taking it right down the left field line, but Sullivan was really playing the opposite field to Helton. And that's why he's held to a single, and this is the other reason. Yeah, he is struggling to run. Looks like he's running a little bit sore. But you know what I liked about that? Shows why Sullivan's such a good outfielder. He didn't take anything for granted. A lot of outfielders would just run over there and lob it back in. Well, of course, he also knows, knows Todd Helton, yes. having played with him in Colorado, and the fact that Todd has slowed down. Here's Brad Hopp. By the way, we were talking about Seth Smith before, that the Rockies lead the world in left-handed former SEC quarterbacks. Right. Todd Helton, of course, was Peyton Manning's backup at Tennessee. Tennessee. They must have some fun when it turns to September and October, right? Each with their own come up and uh, which team is the better team. Hop took a call third strike his first time up. It's been a breakout season for Brad Hop as you look at Troy Tulowitzki on deck. Hop and Jason Marquis were the Rockies All Stars this year. Considering where you and I went, we know nothing about big time football there. Uh, no. <laughs> In the Ivy League, it's only a rumor. <laughs> It's a reason to have the bands play. There is one great advantage to Ivy League football if you're at the game. No TV timeouts. That's right. <laughs> Games take two and a half hours to play. <laughs> After the punt, teams change sides, snap the ball. That's it. Three snaps and a cloud of dust and pump that football. <laughs> Here we go. All right. <laughs> or a pass through a foot and a half behind the receiver. <laughs> Chris, you no, know, you went to Yale. They actually play football there. <laughs> Columbia, they're still working on it. Well, Cornell has had a few players come out of there. They uh, have. Ed Marinero, of course, was one that comes to mind. Did he, did he win the uh, Heisman? Yeah, uh, yes, he did. Yes, yes he, he did. did. Yes. 1973. I, I think believe. he had the most yards in the country that season. There's a couple of fans, by the way. That's, uh, that's for Tatis. Uh, maybe. Maybe it's shared. What's the cameraman doing? <laughs> Is he goofy or what? Trying not to stay in front of the number. Two and two to hop. By the way, it's a great pitching matchup in Florida tonight, folks. It's uh, Ricky Nolasco against Jair Jurgens, and it's one nothing Atlanta in the third. Braves just took the lead in that game. Braves and Marlins are tied for second place in the East, seven games behind the Phillies, and they're both three games behind Colorado for the wild card. Seventh pitch of the at bat to hop. And he pulls one toward the hole, cut off by Murphy. Gets the out at second. Core of the relay and a beautiful double play. Three to six to one, and it's all about Daniel Murphy. Carlos Delgado's glove working wonders. Well, nice play, pure reaction. The key to that was that he came off the bat. He hustled off the bat to get into the hole. You see a lot of first basemen that are lazy when they hold a runner on. And they don't come off the bag. Murphy was was hustling off the bag and therefore takes away a first and third situation. A good hustle by Pelf, and you know you got to love all our talk about the SEC quarterbacks. How about Alex Cora with the lead to Pelfrey? He had to put a little air under that throw to get Pelfrey in line to make that play. So that's a pitcher. We'll appreciate that. Always good defense. Ronnie, I've always wondered, for a, especially for a right-hand pitcher, you're looking to second base to find the shortstop and looking for the bag at the same time. How do you do that? Well, if you're experienced at, do it, at doing it and you've done it for a long period of time, it shouldn't be a problem. The only difference is, is when you are covering first, when it's a ground ball to the first baseman, you run towards the line and then square up and run through the bag. When you are um, doing a double play, 
you run straight to the bag because you want to get there as quick as possible. Brace yourself against it and then pick up the ball and hope it's right there. Try not to look too much at the at the shortstop. You see, get to the bag first, then peek over your shoulder, and he got lucky here. It was a perfect throw by Cora with the great timing. If that throws a little behind him, it's in the dugout. Now, he's not looking at the bag, but he was still able to find it effectively as Tulowitzki singles up the middle to keep the inning alive. Now, is that... The, is that not the way he should have done it? No, no. I think he, he it's different for uh, uh, different guys. I think for me, I honestly would look at the bag and get my bearings and make sure that I had the right route, and then I would go straight at it. But for Mike, I think he picked it up really quickly. He knew he was on the right line to get to the bag and then wanted to pick up the throw. So different players do it different ways. Different pitchers do it different way. Watch. He, he saw the bag. Then he peeked over his shoulder. He knows he's on the right line. The key here, though is that Mike got over there just a tiny bit late. Mm -hmm. If you get there a little earlier, you can brace yourself against the bag just in case it's a bad throw. That way, right there, if that was a bad throw, he never could have made the play. Ian Stewart drives one into right field. Boy, that double play is looking big now. No fooling. A couple of two-out hits for Tulowitzki and Stewart. Three hits in the inning for the Rockies. And that is that is a 2-2 ball game right now without that double play. You know, my, my problem here is that I would go if I was a catcher and talk to Mike because what he's tried to do is rush through this lineup the first time through. Now it's the second time through. He's still throwing majority of fastballs. This is the part of the game where you have to start to mix it up, start to mix your slider and start to mix your change up. 54 pitches with two out in the, in the fourth inning. Chris Iannetta comes to back, grounded into a double play his first time up. Two out and two on. Mets with a 2 nothing lead in the fourth. Remember, Pelf has been having trouble, Ron, yeah. with the box and pitching from the stretch with men on base. And he always seems the fourth or fifth inning seems to hit a wall occasionally sometimes. Well, the double play is a pitcher's best friend, yeah. and this inning it certainly has been for Pelf because he's in a world of trouble without that double play. And go back to the first play of the inning, Helton unable to get to second base on that ball hit down the line. Think how much different the inning would be now had he been on second base instead of first. Absolutely. Defense, defense, yep. defense. Man, no one talks about it enough. It just saves your bacon if you are a team that struggles to score runs. One and one to Ionetta. And the slider swung and missed. Good one. One and two. Took a little off this slider. Good pitch by Pelf. Three sliders in a row here at Ionetta. Got him out in front. What's the book on Ionetta, you think? Well, after that first at bat, yeah, exactly. He doesn't like the breaking ball. But, you know, he did get him out on that fastball in. I think he'll try to pop one inside if he misses. And then he can go back to the slider. Four sliders in a row is a lot of sliders to throw to one hitter. One two low and away nice stop by Schneider on the back end and it's two and two to Ionetta by the way our back statistician Dave Freed points out Ed Marinaro did not win the Heisman Trophy runner up to Pat Sullivan that's right in Auburn 71 Auburn quarterback number seven I believe wasn't he in Auburn it was a single digit number he had a great senior year. Runners go, the 2-2, outside, throw to third, and safe, just safe, is Tulowitzki as they execute the double steal. Schneider thought it might have been strike three, yep. and is talking about it with Larry Van over the home plate umpire, but Larry called it ball three instead. Wants it away, come, oh boy, did get it away. I think what happened there is that Schneider came out of the crouch and blocked the umpire. Agreed. And a very close play at third. Well, Tulowitzki just barely got there. He started that slide so early. Right trying to block the bag. That's how you get spiked. So now the tying runs in scoring position with two out. A three and two count to Ionetta. Too high, ball four. And now the bases are loaded for Clint Barmas. So after the double play, he left two out and nobody on. Base hits by Tulowitzki and Stewart. A double steal. Now a walk of Ionetta. Dan Warthin had a jog out to the mound before Pelfrey goes after Barmas. 
Well, I think what Dan Worth and a couple things he's going to tell him. The scouting report last night, we saw Barmas likes that ball middle of the plate in. And I think even more importantly, because he's gotten into this trouble, let's get him out of the windup. Two outs, go from the windup, go get yep. Barmas and get him out. Normally you don't want to go yeah. from the windup because a double in the gap. Now the runner from first is going to score. But you know you've got a guy out there who's laboring from the stretch. Let him wind up. A lot of pitching coaches have said, I don't mind the windup until three and two because on three and two, if I go for the windup, then yeah. guys get enormous jumps. Yeah, but but for Mike and the anxiety he sometimes has out of the uh, stretch position, I would definitely have him in the windup. But he's he's going to pitch from the stretch. Barmas struck out his first time up. Base is loaded, two down, two nothing New York, fourth inning. And Barmas takes a knee-high strike, nothing in one. Good Good pitch there. It brings back memories. At one time, uh, Dwight Gooden lost a game going into windup, Gary, with the bases loaded two outs against the Reds, and Pete Rose was on first and scored on a double in the gap that didn't get to the wall because Dwight went in the windup. By the way, I would always want Doc in the windup. Yep. <laughs> it was a rare loss for Doc that year, I believe. I remember him losing a game on a balk. That's right. Philadelphia. It's my fault. Yeah, you were screaming at him, weren't yeah, you? That was my fault. I apologize to him. We'll get it into takes a big man to issue that kind of apology. Oh, felt terrible. 1-1 one, one to Barmas. Fouls it back. And Stoffer kept the ball away from him. 1-2. and two. Well, they went after him with two fastballs both away in good spots. Pump's going to have to watch himself here because uh, when you have a runner on third like Tulowitzki, might give you a good fake down the line here on this big moment. Pumper's not a strikeout pitcher, but he's already struck out four tonight. Ahead on Barmas, one and two with the bases full. Too high. Two and two. Well, that's where... Schneider wanted it up, but it tailed up and in. No chance of Barmer swinging at that pitch. Now, you always would think if you will go up in the strike zone, the next pitch is going to be down in the strike zone, whether it's a sinker in or a slider away. Alfred awkwardly stepping off there. So he constantly has to be wary of. But you certainly don't want him thinking about it either. Two two inside ball three. So now that merry-go-round will be in motion with the bases loaded three and two and two down. Barmas last night of course hit his home run on a three two pitch three two fastball middle of the plate in. Twenty fifth pitch of the inning upcoming for Pelfrey. The runners all get set to take off. Popped it up. Murphy calling, Castillo calls him off. Side retire. A huge pitch for Mike Pelfrey to get himself out of trouble. Three hits and a one.
Mets bidding for their fourth straight win and leading the Rockies 2-0 as we go to the bottom of the fourth at City Field. Enjoy an afternoon with the 69 Mets at City Field, Saturday, August 22nd, for charity. Your donation includes food, beverage, and a ticket for that night's game against the Phillies. Get to MetsFoundation.com or call 718-803-4074. Daniel Murphy got the Mets started in the second inning with a leadoff double. Came around to score. Leads off in the fourth inning. And he takes ball one from Jason Marquis. It'll be Murphy, then Jeff Francoeur, and Corey Sullivan in the bottom of the fourth. Mets with two runs and five hits off Marquis. Well, Murphy's first at bat. After the first inning, every ball was on the knees. Marquis raised that fastball just a little bit in the middle of the plate. And we saw the catcher set up away, and that ball had too much plate in her half. And Murphy looking to turn on another one. Almost took out Frank Kerr in the on deck circle. And watch. See what he just did right there? When I was a rookie and I came up, and I threw a ball into the stands, it was a $500 fine. A hundred dollar fine, excuse me. You didn't have 500. Paul Pryor. Paul Pryor was the first base on fire, and he said, Keith, I'm not going to give you a break. I know you're a rookie, but it's a hundred dollar fine if you get the balls to the fans. Things are I said, I said, said much really? friend friendly now. Yeah, I said, I, I, I just couldn't believe it. Now, guys, toss balls to fans when there's two out. <laughs> Milton Bradley, <laughs> right? Well, Benny Agbayani wants to do this. Yes, yes. I, was, I was at that game, and I was working that game, actually. Benny was such a good sport. He well, was a good guy, wasn't he? He really was. Still is. Yes, of course. Why would he change? <laughs> 3-2 to Murphy. And he pops one. Of course, Benny went over to Japan to play for Bobby Valentine. That was as poor, but well, not as poor, as an average or below average an outfield for a championship team I've ever, I've ever seen. That, 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 that team. You had Agbayani, you had Jay Payton, you had Darrell Hamilton. 3-2, just inside ball four, and Murphy's on again, leading off. Third straight inning, the Mets have gotten the leadoff man out against Marquis. That's his first walk. I saw it came across the wire that Bobby Valentine is not going to go back to right. his Japanese club. All the lobbying by the fans that love Bobby it didn't work. Won a championship over there in 2005. Well, you have to think that Bobby undoubtedly will be managing somewhere here in the States next year. Here's Frank Kerr, who singled in a run his first time up, and he drives one to left field, chasing Smith back. He's got plenty of room to make the catch. One away. Well, I tell you what, that was just, I think, a little bit towards the end of the bat. Let's take a peek. This is a pitch hole hanger. Just got it away from the barrel enough. And this was back of the base hit back in the second. And you can see there the difference. And that's the base hit into right center field that drove in the first Met run. And he's swinging the bat great. Let me ask you a question, Keith. If, if you're set up to go away and a guy throws you a hanger like that, you taking that ball to right or are you going to adjust well, it no, and turn you're, on it? You're, um, it depends on the hitter. I can speak for myself. But when I went to the other way, I set up up the middle. It was over the shortstop's head. If he throws a, a helicopter up there, it's a... It's a couple miles per hour slower you can catch up to it and pull it with authority like Frank Corr did runner goes Sullivan on the hit and run booted by Barmas Murphy goes to third and the Mets have runners at the corners the Mets played hit and run Barmas moving toward the bag was in perfect position to field it but just booted it well you gotta wonder if Barmas took that last at bat out into the field with him here. This is Taylor made double play. He got down on his knees to block it. Well, we saw him make a great play in the first inning. I always think on that play, one, it took a little funny hop, but I always think when the runner's running, does the infielder ever take his eye just a little bit off that baseball to try to get the quick toss to second to get the double play? Ninth error of the year for Barmas, and that puts the Mets in business. First and third and one out. Well, they're going to play back here, and I'm rightly so. We're in only in the fourth inning. Marquis needs a double play, and you got the guy who hit on the ground. Schneider's a good double play candidate. 
Fouled out to first base, his first trip, and lifts this one to left. That'll get the run in at least. Back goes Smith. He's there to grab it. And tagging and coming home easily is Murphy. Faking the go from first base is Sullivan. Sacrifice fly for Brian Schneider makes it 3-0 New York. So the Mets get a run without a base hit. A walk, an error, and a sacrifice fly produce an unearned run. Well, nicely done, Gary. We talked about it last time going the other way. Sacrifice flies needed. Really, you want to, that's second best. You want to continue the rally and maybe begin to continue a big inning. But that is, you'll take the sacrifice fly. The Mets are doing all the little things right now. Well, you were talking about it today in the food room, Keith. You said when you're in a sacrifice fly situation, you want to stay inside the baseball, lead with that right arm if you're a left-handed hitter, and make sure that you don't roll over the pitch, which Brian did perfectly there. Alex Cora had a base hit to left his first time up. Pulls that one into right field for another hit. Sullivan will go first to third. Cora is going to test the arm of Brad Hopp. Here comes the throw to second, and Cora is out to end the inning. Now with the pitcher on deck, Cora taking a little gamble there with two outs, and he gets thrown out by the strong arm of Brad Hopp to end the inning. The Mets pick up an unearned run, and he had Mike Pelfrey a 3 0 lead. Here's your fifth inning recap brought to you by Chili's. Mike Pelfrey has now gone 17 and two thirds consecutive scoreless innings against the Colorado Rockies, dating back to his last three starts against Colorado. And he's held them off the board for four innings tonight. It's amazing when you just have that, we used to call it the little wheeling feeling against certain teams. You just felt comfortable facing this lineup, and so far, so good for Mike Pelfrey. Jason Marquis, one of the better hitting pitchers in baseball. Flight out to left field his first time up tonight. Right hand pitcher, but a left hand batter. Marquis has five career home runs. One of them came last year. A grand slam against John Denise. And that was a hanging breaking ball from Jonathan. That's gave up two grand slams to pitchers last year. Felix Hernandez hit one off Santana, right? Yep. And I think, was it two years ago, Dontrell Willis had one? It went off Lima time. What number did he wear? Jose Lima. I can't remember. <laughs> Same number as Dae Sung Koo. Well, here's Felix Hernandez. This one is a shocker. He went oppo. Yes, he did. That's weird seeing old Shea, isn't it? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> That's strange. Very sad. Oh! It paved paradise and put up a parking lot. It's like going back to the old neighborhood and seeing your old building <laughs> that's torn down that's for a right. shopping center. That's right. Nice little Joni Mitchell, Ronnie. Oh. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> the 
little more sensitive than he thinks. <laughs> Jason Marquis, the pride of Tottenville High School on Staten Island. Loops one into shallow left. In comes Sullivan. One out. So twice Marquis has flied out to Corey Sullivan in left field. Got and now Dexter Fowler. Got to see Corey play a lot in spring training. Spring training is a little different. You got the wind, ball carries out of the ballpark, really fools a lot of the outfielders. I didn't realize how good of an outfielder he is. The jump he gets on the baseball. He was in competition during spring training with guys like Bobby Kelty and Jeremy Reed, and Reed won the job. The bunt picked out of the air by Murphy, and Fowler retired. And Reed won the job. He and Sullivan were about equal defensively, but Jeremy hit a little better during spring training, and that's why he got the job. But, you know, it, it's been a terrible um, confluence of circumstances for Jeremy Reed. Early on, he didn't get to play at all. Finally snuck his way into the lineup because the Mets had a need, but for three or four days when he got to play, he didn't hit, and now it's Sullivan who's getting the chance instead of Reed, who has spent far more time on that bench than he liked this year. Well, you always try to play a hot hand. You call someone up from the minor leagues who's red hot, coming up in a groove, playing every day, and you kind of try to catch lightning in a bottle. Here's Seth Smith with two out and nobody on. Did, did his parents, when they named him, understand how difficult it is to say Seth Smith? They, they did not have you in mind, Terry. <laughs> that would be tough for the play-by-play. Oh, but how about for everybody else he ever meets? <laughs> right. How about for him? How, how hard do you think it is for him to ten times a day have to say, Hi, I'm Seth Smith. That's right. It's tough. Call me Seth. There's no way, there's no short way around that. Two syllables. O2 from Pelfrey. A little high with a fastball. Marlins have gone in front of the Braves two to one as they go to the fourth. Good game down in Miami. Well, I just did not think the Marlins would be able to hang in there. I know it's a long way to go. With that bullpen of theirs, and they got rid of a lot of guys that had good years in that bullpen last year for them. Boy, they've hung in there. They're a feisty bunch. Got Luis Ayala in that bullpen now. And they got Ramirez hitting 350 yeah. and uh, knocking in a run every night. Well, their starting pitching is good. Yep. And their offense is good. Their defense is a question, and obviously the bullpen as well. Breaking ball hit to left, and Sullivan, after a late start, comes in to grab it. And Mike Pelfrey has himself a 1 2 3 inning. We're halfway through. 3 0 New York. In the All-Star game, the Mets keep driving. Against their old tormentors, the Giants and Dodgers, the Mets win 11 of 12 home games. And in every imaginable way, what a change. Cody hits a routine fly against the Dodgers in the ninth to win a game. But the dependable Maury Wills can't find the ball. Is there magic working for the Mets? Bad. 
Magic indeed, and it's hard to remember now what it meant when the Dodgers and Giants used to come to town to play the Mets. Yeah. Those were always the most electric games of the season because you still had plenty of old Dodger and Giant fans who would uh, come out to root for their team and a lot of uh, people who had been Giant and Dodger fans who were there to boo their old team for having uh, deserted the city. It wasn't their fault, it was ownership. Yeah. You gotta take it out on someone. <laughs> We're gonna take it out on. I mean, you know, it's hard to boo Walter O'Malley if he doesn't show up. Well, I can tell you, being a West Coast kid, that we were very pleased to have baseball in the Bay Area. That you were. Mike Pelfrey fouls one off, and it's one and two. Broke my grandfather's heart. He was a huge Giants fan. Ah, it's a helmet day, Gary. That was one of my favorite uh -oh. promotions at Shea. Helmets in the days before ear flaps. We should still have bat day then oh, too, right? No bat day uh, today. We, we didn't have many bat no. days at Shea. No. Bat day was a Yankee Stadium thing. They, 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 I think they might have had one or two bat days at Shea. Well, you know how they have so many different colored hats now. Where I grew up, when you went to Fenway Park for hat day, that was the hat you had. Right. And everyone had that hat. That was it. Offrey hits one toward the right field line and foul ball. Banner Day. I'm not Banner Day. I mean, you got the when they gave away the pennants. Oh you know, yeah, the pennants. Part. Yeah, I love getting those pennants. You know the one they tried. Uh, I think it was only once. Seat cushion day. Yeah, and everybody. Yes. Cushion. Helicopters come onto the field. That's not that one. Yep. How about the big disco night in White Midwell? Well, Old Comiskey. Disco double issue night <laughs> in '79. <laughs> Great idea. And a foul tip held by Ionetta. And that is the second strikeout of the night for Jason Marquis. Not only did Disco Night be was it, was it a fiasco, Bill Beck was then the owner of the White Sox. They ruined the field. Yes, right. They, they had to forfeit the second game of the doubleheader. Yeah, second game of the doubleheader. That was, um, it was actually, I believe it was um, Mike Beck, Bill's son, who came up with the idea. Yes. Along with a local radio station to uh, build a bonfire of disco records. And people went nuts. Did Bill Beck uh, own the St. Louis Browns for a bit? Yes. And he, he, he had a little short guy, Eddie Goodell. Hitter. Eddie Goodell. Yes. So how tall was he? Was a, he was three a, foot seven. Number oh, one eight. Number one eight. Yes. And you had him as a pinch hitter. And uh, the, the story was that uh, that he put out was that there was a sharpshooter in the stands, and if Eddie Goodell swung at a pitch, <laughs> he was told to fire. That's pressure. Isn't that great? <laughs> well, he took four pitches and he walked. And that was the end of his big league career. On the inside corner, strike three called, and Pagan is down looking. So back to back strikeouts for Marquis to start at the bottom of the fifth. Again, that fastball inside, just like the first at bat to Pagan, not picking that up out of the hand of Marquis. Let's see if you'd like this pitch, Keith, as a hitter. Ooh, close. Close. Too close Too to close take. To take. Yeah. Very good running. You can't argue with an umpire in that one. If he gives it to the pitcher, you got to go sit down. Frank Pulley rang me up one time against Fernando Valenzuela in Dodger Stadium on a pitch just like that, and I just I walked the dugout. And we Castillo oh. takes a strike. This is his base hit on the third. And that, that cutter again, Keith. And he didn't get it in enough. In the first at bat, he got in on, he got in on his hands. Well, he banked one off the second base bag for a base hit to drive in a run in that third inning. Well, the book on Louis is to pitch him inside, and you got to pitch him inside and up. I always found that these hitters, like Louis, who inside out the ball, I always thought I was doing him a favor if I threw the ball in. I used to like to play him away, throw something down and away. The ball up and away is one they can handle, but down and away, and hopefully you make a play out there. Drops down one with foul. Even Pete Rose, because that would be a hitter left-handed. Pete went that way well. By the time I had to face Pete, and Pete was still a great hitter then, is um, he was a, it was a different hitter to face because he had become so a part of the baseball culture that umpires would not call a strike on him. So you couldn't get a called strike, so you really just had to throw the ball down the middle and let him hit it. It's funny you say that because I, I still remember Pete's reaction when Gene Garber struck him out to end his 44 game hitting streak in 78. And, uh, you know, Pete not only expected to get every call from the umpire, but he expected 
room service from the pitchers, too. <laughs> he was very upset with Garber, and his quote in the paper was that he thought it was the seventh game of the World Series. He said, What's Garber he? leaped in the air, remember? <laughs> that's, huh? that's right. I mean, it's not like Pete was giving up at bats. Why shouldn't Garber have been competitive? Garber, uh, Gene Garber was a great competitor. Castillo pulls one foul. And Garber started out with the Phillies and then bounced over. He got traded to the Braves. He had that good changeup, didn't he, Keith? Yeah, he always, I always got in front of the box on him because he had the weird motion. He turned his back on you, yeah. threw underhand almost. Right. So I stood up in front of the plate and got on top of the plate, and guess what he did? He pitched me inside, and he got me out. Ball three, another quality at bat for Castillo. Who just, I mean, he's hitting 403 in July. You've been through this, Keith. I mean, he just must be seeing everything right well, now. Well, everything's in slow motion. And it's lined to short one hop to Tulowitzki. And so they get Castillo out to end the inning. A one, two, three inning for Jason Marquis, his first of the night. That's a little blue smoke action. Looks good. Got your pulled pork, got your ribs. I'm hungry. A little chicken. Nice. Mm. Are we send a runner out there? <laughs> the ribs to me. I haven't That's had as good as it gets. Yet. That looks great. Here's your ATT pitcher's high speed. Mike Belfry's topped out at 97 today. Jason Marquis at 93. Belfry, who has the upper hand on the scoreboard, a 3 0 lead as we start the sixth. Part of the batting order, and Todd Helton takes curveball from Belfry for a strike. Very nice. Mixing in secondary pitches. No, Keith, sorry. Oh, well, so I don't want to tell you astute Met fans out there, this is a very critical inning yeah. for uh, Mr. Pelfrey, the heart of the order. Belton, Hop, and Tulowitzki, oh. and uh, without throwing a fastball, Pelfrey gets ahead on Helton 0 and 2. Helton has walked and then singled to left. Remember, he hit it down the left field line, but managed only a single out of it and that had a huge impact in the fourth inning as uh, he was then doubled up. There's Dick. Good by town when the Rays aren't How even about playing. That? He's a big Rays fan. He's got right. to be doing something for uh, ESPN here in New York. It's not college basketball season now. He can relax well, he, if, as much as Dick ever relaxes. Well he's a true fan too because he was a fan of those Rays when they were struggling. Helton pops one up. Schneider looking for it, but not much room back there, and it sails out of play. Two more games to go in this series. Tomorrow night, Johan Santana tries to bounce back from a tough start in Houston on Friday. And Jason Hamill, who came over from the Rays, will pitch for Colorado. 7 o'clock game tomorrow night. Then a noontime start on Thursday. Jonathan Neese tries to back up his excellent performance in Houston against the red-hot lefty Jorge De La Rosa. 
Taylor Rosa started out miserably this year. He arguably has been the one of the best pitchers in the National League the last two months. He's won seven straight, eight since June 1st, and Hamill tomorrow has an ERA of under two in his starts on the road. Pretty good at bat by Helton here. Pelf got ahead 0-2 on backdoor breaking stuff, and then he fought off two up-and-in fastballs, and now he's strung out the count here to 2-2. Two and two. This will be his 85th pitch of the night, working to the first batter in the sixth inning. And he fouls off the breaking ball to stay in the at-bat. So, Ronnie, when you throw a good back door right there, they hit it with two strikes. In your mind, you got to be saying, do I have him inside? Can I go in there and get him? I, I think you do. The problem with Helton, he's so quick inside. And you know he's one of the best hitters, so he's going to fall off some good pitches. You just don't want to get the 3-2 because he has such a good eye. Line, base hit. So Helton on base for the third straight time. A single... A walk and another single. Five hits now against Pelfrey. Leadoff man on in the sixth. Let's check in with Kevin. Well, guys, Jonathan Neese today doing the good things off the field. He was reading to kids in a library in Brooklyn, and I asked him what book. He said, the three little pigs except from the uh, wolf's point of view, which I didn't know such a thing existed. <laughs> but I was talking to him about, of course, the performance he had his first time here and what he's doing between starts things that he worked on in AAA. You know what he worked on? He worked on not tipping his pitches. He showed me that when he holds his glove, and he didn't even realize this, but he just has a tough time keeping that fan out there for some reason or another. So they worked on that a lot in AAA. He's worked on it since he's come up with Dan Worthen and a couple of other guys as well. And he's comfortable now. He's made some adjustments. And, and that, as well as his cutter and everything else, a big part of his performance. We'll see if he could do that again on Wednesday, guys. I wonder which pitch he was tipping because he's, he's so curveball dominant. Yeah. Are you as apt to tip a curve as you are to tip a changeup? I always think that people tip their changeups more than their breaking pitches. Usually it's the third pitch they develop. Uh, the, the grip is always a little awkward grip. It's the kind of grip you have when you're a kid, when you're five, six, seven years old, when your hands aren't big enough to grip the baseball. So the curveball is natural for him. Fastball is natural. I think the change is the one from almost all pitchers that they tend to give away. Why don't you show the fans after this pitch, Ron, what the fan is. A lot of people don't know what the heck that means. Hop just got a piece to stay alive. Well, if you use this in my hand as a glove, okay, usually when you're throwing a fastball, your glove is like this. What most pitchers do when they go get the change-up grip, they fan their glove like this, and it alerts hitters like Mr. Hernandez Rusty. what's coming. Mr. Staub. And uh, that's when you run into trouble. You guys at home, the best way to defend that and stop that from happening after this pitch. Popped a mile high into shallow left. And Corey Sullivan waits for it to come down out of the clouds for the first down. One out and one on. Time for a New York State Smokers quit line game break. Let's go to the studio with Chris Carlin. That hit, Hanley Ramirez is now hitting 351. Maybe the biggest obstacle between Albert Pujols and a triple crown. Here's Troy Tulowitzki, one for two on the day. Single to center, stole a base in the fourth. And he drops down a beautiful bunt, and Wright will just put it in his pocket. A perfect bunt single by the red hot Troy Tulowitzki. And that'll get the tying run to the plate for the Rockies. Well, uh, just nice bunch, and of course, well disguised. Wright's got to play back with the power. 19 home runs of Tulowitzki, and surprised everyone. See Pelf not expecting. He doesn't even move. Wright's playing very deep at third base. Let me ask you about this, because this is a guy who's red hot with the bat, and yeah, it was a great bunt, no question about it. But do you like the play? I don't mind the play if it's successful. You're down three runs, and you've got this, you've got a lot of power in this lineup. They've just been one hit away from breaking, you know, scoring a lot of runs in this game. And last night as well. Yep. They ran through a lot of opportunities to break the game open before the Mets came back last night. As Ian Stewart takes ball one. So a, a lot of credit to Met pitchers that they pitched out of jams. And, uh, of course, 
Stokes had two beautiful innings last night. Feliciano had one and Rodriguez. Perez struggled a bit, but he got out of some jams. Now Pelfrey facing sixth inning trouble. Stewart is walked and single. And he pops one up. This should be playable for David Wright. Staggering and holds on to the ball. Now David's starting to run into trouble. But he managed to grab it and hang on to it. Oh, he's backpedaling is always trouble. You know what happened there? He called that so early that Alex Cora let him have it and went to cover third base. He might have run into Cora. Watch Cora. He'll go over there, but David calls it so early that oh. Alex gives up on it, goes to cover third, and it kept drifting to left field. <laughs> He'll have a laugh, of course. Got to wonder if there's some swirling wind in here that's kind of coming in and swirling that made that ball push out to left. So two out and two on now for Chris Iannetta, and he oh. takes a strike. Well, we showed the flags early in the game blowing out toward left field, so may have grabbed that ball. Iannetta has grounded into a double play and walked tonight 0 for 1. The Rockies have six hits, but they've yet to get on the board against Pelfrey, who threw eight scoreless against them last year, the last time he faced them. How about that? Drive in theater, Keith, way before the intermission. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right field scoreboard has been non functional tonight. Center field board's working okay. In tight with the fastball, two and one to Ionetta. Did your parents take you to drive ins? Yeah, big time. I big love them. Time. I absolutely. I saw the Ten Commandments there when I, was, when I was a little kid. That's the right movie to see on that kind of screen, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Cecil B. DeMille, epic. In Panavision. That's oh, right. hey, when he parted the Red Sea, I about died. I said, oh, that was an amazing visual. The Rockies in this series just 1 for 12 with runners in scoring position, 0 for 4 tonight. Ionetta fouls it off Schneider. Got him on the foot. Yeah, off his toe. Now the Rockies were a hot ball club coming in. Jim Tracy took over in late May. And they have been raging hot. Meanwhile, Schneider trying to walk that last one off, and he is in some degree of pain as they're giving him some time to try and feel better. And it's a beautiful sinker by Pelfrey, too. One of the best ones he's thrown and in a perfect spot for it, too, when he needs to make his pitches. You know, I know some catchers in the mm. olden days would wear the steel toe on their spike to try to protect against that. Remember the old toe plates? That's right. Yes. Pitchers still wear toe plates? No. We got a new pair of shoes. You had to have a toe plate when you were a kid because you're not going to get another pair. Yeah, exactly. You wear a hole in that toe. Right. Two and two to Ionetta. Oh, Hit him. and that'll load up the bases. No, last time he walked Ionetta to load the bases. This time he hits him. So Belfry in another jam. Well, trying to come inside and up, and this ball gets away from him. Gets the tricep of Mr. Ionetta, and he's built like a rock anyway, so that just bounces off like it bounced off the Hulk. Painful at bat for Schneider and for Ionetta, the two catchers. So now, Pelfrey will face Barmas again with the bases loaded. Dan Warthin first will take a trip to the mound. He did last time as well. Bobby Parnell will start to work in the Mets bullpen. And this is just a little stall right here to get Parnell up and get him some pitches. And they're going to probably going to stay out there and make the umpire come. Home plate umpire Larry Vanover come out and break up the tea party. 98 pitches tonight for Pelfrey as he works here in the sixth inning. You can just walk off. The pitching coach can walk off that mound too and take his time. And umpire is telling him right there, come on guys, let's break it up. Let's go. Still linger a little longer for Danny Wharton as they try to get Parnell up. It'll be very interesting on this first pitch. On the last time Barmas was up with the bases loaded, he took a fastball for a strike down and away. It'll be interesting if Pelfrey goes right back to that pitch. 
And if Barmas is thinking along with Pelf. Barmas 251 coming into the game with eight home runs off right handers. He's never had a grand slam in his career. He gets his second bases loaded opportunity of the night. Belfry went to three and two on him last time before he got him to pop up. Tying runs on base with two out. And Barmas swings and misses at that first pitch fastball. Nothing and one. Gasoline right there. What do they used to call Keith? Old country hardball, right? Going right after Barmas. Ball, but he just put something extra on that. 96 miles per hour. Again, Gary, like you said, using that four seamer much more than he has earlier this season. And getting some good velocity with it. And Barmas down an 0 2 hole after two high fastballs. Out of the strike zone. We like hitters when they're not patient. People always talk about the pressure is on the pitcher when the bases, is low, the bases are loaded. Sometimes the hitter gets anxiety too. Wants to hit the ball early. O2. Didn't get to chase that one. Ball and two strikes. But he has thrown two fastballs by Barmas, and you just don't want to throw anything up there, let him catch up to it. Anything off speed. More apt, though, being a way to hit her to hit the ball to right field with two strikes. Popped up. Second straight time he's gotten him to pop up with the bases loaded. Frank Kerr will handle this one. And Belfry has worked his way out of another jam. The Rockies leave him loaded for the second time. And Belfry has shut him out through six, leading 3-0. Through 19 and two thirds consecutive scoreless innings against them. 102 pitches deep into this game, and after watching them throw 96 in the last inning, he wants to keep going. He's got one more in him, they say. You know, it's funny now, you don't see the guys do it anymore, Keith. I used to love on these hot days, get the trainer with that ammonia water. Yep. Right? The ammonia water was a beautiful thing, particularly Ooh. in St. Louis on that turf. Oh, when those hot Ooh. August days in July. Of course, um, when you were playing, guys had to change their shirts on humid days. Now they wear these dry fit shirts. Yeah. They don't have to change as often. I would change two, three times in a game like this easily. Part of the batting order as the Mets look to expand their lead against Jason Marquis. And David Wright takes off the plate for ball one. David singled to center in the first, hit into a fielder's choice in the third, one for two. Now has a seven game hitting streak working. And he hits this one well to center field, chasing Fowler back to the track. Near the wall, it's off the high part of the fence. And Wright hustles into second base with a double. 408 feet and about 12 feet up on the wall. 
and David just can't find the right spot. Hanger right here, and David just launches, but hey, nicely done. David is really starting to swing the bat good. Remember, he hit one up on the hill in Houston. There would have been a home run here. This one, just not quite high enough off the middle part of that fence. Hey, nice play by Fowler off the wall there. Played it beautifully. He ran a long way for that ball. Well, two balls that David's hit 420 feet. Both of them doubles. 27 doubles for the year now for David. And he took nothing for granted in this ballpark. And he still has to hustle with the second base. Did you see that frown between first and second? Like, you gotta be kidding Not me. again. <laughs> that was great. Murphy doubled down the right field line and scored in the second. Then he walked and scored in the fourth. That's with single runs in the second, third, and fourth, and that's been enough for Pelfrey so far. Right edging off second as though he's thinking about stealing third. Watch his face between first and second. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got a feel for him. I mean, he's got six home runs this year, and in the ballpark hasn't cost him, you know, hasn't cost him a dozen home runs, but maybe it's cost him four or five. Say, what do I gotta do? Look, well, Tulowitzki's got to be a little careful here. He's got to get behind David a little bit. David can steal third. Three and one to Murphy, and he hits one in the air to center. That's it. Well, chasing Fowler back. Right will go back to tag. Fowler's got it. David tries for third. Fowler with a strong arm, but it comes up short. And now right at third with one out. Good read by David Wright. Another nice at bat, Keith, by these Met hitters. Situational hitting. Well, David does the right thing here. <laughs> Perfect. Don't go back and forth. You make your read. Plenty of time. Stay firmly planted. You can go either, either direction. You make your read. Get back and tag up. And you love that. You love to see Murphy, who just got an 0 for 1 on his scorecard. Clap his hands yes. because he knows he did something productive. And get grats from his teammates. New York Mets baseball on SNY is brought to you by Xerox, document services provider to the Mets. Xerox ready for real business. Well, Jason Marquis already down 3 0. Got a big spot here. The infield's going to have to come in for Jeff Francoeur, who drove in the first Mets one with a second inning single. And Francoeur in another. Great RBI situation. Halfway on the middle infielders and third base. And Jeff is hit by the pitch, and that's stunk. Well, they're going to pitch him inside. They're going to try to jam him. That looked like it got him in the hand. Yes, it did on that bottom of the left hand. Mm. Knuckles. Ouch. Only the second batter Marquis has hit this season. I think he'll be. He got him on the flat of the flat of the hand. I think he'll be all right. You get it on the wrist. That's where it hurts. It throws my freeze cam. You see that ball just follow him. You know, that's where if you can if you can turn that front shoulder in right Keith you take that off the back of the tricep or the back and I think Marquis put a little something extra on yeah, that too did. now first and third for Sullivan with one out or who hit into a double play in the second inning and then reached on an error that could have been a double play in the fourth in another spot where Marquis would love to get a ground ball to turn two. Boy, Sullivan looking at Razor Shines for a long period of time there as Razor went through the signs. Could a squeeze play be in order? I wouldn't. I'd let my left hand hitter swing the bat. 2 0 now to Sullivan with Brian Schneider on deck. You could, on a 2 1 count, put a hit and run on. Yeah. Marquis throws strikes, take you right out of the double play.
Now the 2-0, and he pulls it on the ground sharply. Barmas gets the out at second. The relay in time for the double play. And the Mets are turned aside. Sullivan hits into a double play for the second time tonight. And Marquis is able to get himself out of the inning. Through six. Tonight, the Rockies have had two no-hitters thrown against them. Both pitchers played for the Mets at one time. Can you name them? I got one. I got two. Both in the same year, too. They're no-hit twice in the same year. Now, between innings, Jeff Rancourt, after getting hit on the left hand by a pitch, getting that blue wrap placed on it by Michael Herbst. And when he came into the dugout, we got a little look at the hand, and it looked a little puffy. Yeah, it definitely had a little uh, a swelling there on the back of the left hand. That ball will bite you. Well, Frank Kerr will uh, stay in the game. Mike Pelfrey's thrown six scoreless. He's thrown 102 pitches, but he's out there for the seventh inning. Jason Marquis is done for the night. He'll leave for a pinch hitter here. As Ryan Spielborn's bats for Marquis. The Rockies have had all sorts of chances in both games of this series. Tonight, first inning, they got 2 1 with one out, couldn't score. Loaded the bases in the fourth and again in the sixth, but both times were held off the scoreboard. Feliciano with Parnell up in the bullpen in case Pelfrey needs help here in the seventh. So Spielborg, who went 0 for 4 in the start. Last night in left field gets the pinch hitting assignment here. Here's a good look at that. Oh, you puffiness. can see right there. It's not. Yep. First to blood vessel, didn't it? That you can deal with. Yeah. It's those small bones in your hand that you're really right. concerned about. And as I said, Ron Hunt, my first roommate. Ice pack on that hand overnight. Wrap it up when that ice melts around three in the morning. Put more ice, a fresh pack ice on there, and put it back on. You sleep the whole night with ice, and you will play tomorrow, and you will have no swelling. Now, most of the time now they tell you ice twenty minutes on, twenty minutes off. But that's so after the first first twenty four hours. You've got to you got to ice it to to uh, shrink the capillaries. So the, there's no blood flow going out. Did you ever think of going to medical school? I learned from Ron Hunt. <laughs> did he go to medical school? I don't know, but he sort of got hit enough. <laughs> yes, he did. Fifty times in one season when he was with Montreal. And I was, nobody's challenging that record. I was 19 years old, invited to spring training with the big club, and that was one of the greatest pieces of advice I ever received from a veteran. Just inside of Spielboard's three and two. Only problem they had to rush from the hospital once. His temperature was 89 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothermia. That's right. Dexter Fowler on deck, and then Seth Smith here in the seventh. And Spielborg fouls off the fastball. And Belfry still throwing hard here in the seventh. 96 on that last pitch. He's a big horse. Well, 
Under eight pitches on the night. Again the three two. And again fouled off. The key for any pitcher at this level is when you get deeper into a game, you start to get to where your pitch count for Mike is between 110 and 120. So you keep reminding yourself, use your legs. Because your legs get less tired before your arm does. And you can use your legs to keep throwing the same velocity that you did earlier in the game. Eighth pitch of the advantage to Spillboards. And there'll be a ninth. How do you use your legs, Ron, as opposed to your arm? Well, what happens is that your, your legs are stronger than your arm. But what happens when you get tired, you get lazy with the bottom half of your body. That's the, what it affects first. So what do you try to do? Try to use your arm more to catch up to throw the ball 95 when you're throwing about 92. If you just use your legs, you can still throw free and easy and get it to 95. Bounce toward third, a foul ball. So you, does that mean you're pushing off the rubber with your leg more? Yeah, you know early in the game, as you see uh, Pelfrey as he pushes off that back leg, Early in the game, Keith, it's really early to push off with your back leg. See from the waist down. You see how he's just trying to really explode from that back side. Early in the game, it's very easy. But then later in the game, you're fatigued, your legs get a little tired, and you start to get a little lazy. And you have to just remind yourself that, hey, listen, I need to make sure that every single time I over, almost over-accentuate how hard I'm pushing off the rubber. This will be the tenth pitch of the at bat. And it's on the outside corner. Strike three call. Spielborg's thought he had a walk. Larry Vanover said no. Too close to take. All right, though, it's a strike. That's a good pitch. That is a tough pitch. Knees black outside corner. That is grab some pine. Well, it took a lot of effort, but Pelfrey has his fifth strike out of the night. That's a tough pitch. Wow. Now Dexter Fowler, who's 0 for 3 on the night, tried to bunt his way on his last time and popped it up to Murphy. Whenever a hitter with speed tries to bunt and makes an out, never have to worry about him trying to bunt the rest of the game. No hitter wants to make two outs bunting. And Palfrey falls behind him 2 0. Now Mike now up to 114 pitches. The most he's thrown in the game this year is 115. That was his last start before the All Star break against Cincinnati. A little bit surprised he pinched hit. Oh. Ripped into right field, a base hit for Fowler. Frank Kerr slides after it. Fowler's going to try for two, and he makes it sliding. With a one out double. 21st double of the year for Fowler. Well, nice hustle out of the box. And there's a 2 0 fastball in her half. Right down the pipe, down. And Fowler has tremendous speed. Frank Gore had a chance at him, though, if he had gotten that clean on the slide, but wasn't able to. And you can see how he. Turned it up a notch. Jerry Mangle will come out. That's going to be all for Pelfrey. 115 pitches matches his season high, so he will leave. Double switch. Jeremy Reed's going to come into the game to play left field. And so Reed will bat ninth. The new pitcher, presumably Feliciano with the left hand hitters coming up, will bat sixth. So Feliciano, who pitches just about every day, will pitch this day as well. Mike Pelfrey working on a shutout.
Pedro Feliciano on to pitch. Garrett Atkins in to pinch hit for Seth Smith. Jeremy Reed playing left field. Nice outing last night for Pedro Feliciano. Got the win, inning of work, and a couple strikeouts. And Atkins lifts one down the right field line foul, and quickly Feliciano's ahead 0-2. And, and, folks, I stand corrected on the right-handed bench of the Rockies. Obviously, you got Garrett Atkins up right there. I put Garrett Atkins on my left-handed bench. I made a mistake in my preparation before the game, and I apologize. We weren't going to tell, but that's very honest of you. I'm very upset with myself. We've got the wet noodle if you need it. <laughs> Atkins 0 for 4 in the game last night. He's had a rough season at the plate. And he takes the breaking ball for a call third strike. Little cutter on the outside corner. Gets Atkins for the second out of the inning. Well set up, Ronnie. Looking for a breaking ball. Got a fastball. Mr. Atkins, a couple of years ago, I said this is a perennial 25, 100 RBI guy and just... In a free fall right now. Well, drove in 99 or more three straight years, but this has just been a, an abysmal season. He's lost his starting job. Now Helton has been on base three times in a row, walking two singles. Going away with the cutter, 1-0. What well, I admire about Helton when I watch him in the batter's box, Keith, everything seems so quiet, so confident. Just nice, quick hands. Not a lot of body movement. These are the hitters that Feliciano lives for. Well, he's got a bit of a of a, a odd swing, but you know what? It's all about your take back and getting the barrel of the bat to the ball and squaring it up, and uh, that's what he does. Good slider. Did he swing? No. Third base umpire Charlie Relliford. He has held in a pass, two and one. Plus, he has a very good eye at the plate. Doesn't swing at a lot of bad pitches. Very disciplined hitter. One for five in his career against Feliciano. Beat him with a fastball, and it's two and two. Quick pitch them there, did Feliciano. Surprised him with that fastball. Good pitch inside, too. Beat him. I mean, your approach off Feliciano has got to be the other way, up the, up the middle. You can't try to to pull him, not when you got two strikes on, the, on you. Yeah, Helton fouls that one back. Ooh, that was a good pitch to hit. And you see Helton's reaction there. He slammed his hand on his thigh. That's too much plate right there in that breaking ball. 2,066 career hits for Helton. Two of them tonight. And it's on the outside corner. Strike three call. Feliciano comes in and strikes out Atkins and Helton back to back to keep the Rockies off the board. 3 0 New York.
passionate debate about the Mets, Yankees, and all things New York sports. Catch Brian Custer and Brandon Tierney as they take on the biggest sports topics of the day in the wheelhouse presented by Pepsi. Weekdays at 5.30 only on SNY. Here's your Mets upcoming schedule. All Mets games on SNY are available in HD presented by IOTV. And if you're in the car, listen to every Mets game on Sports Radio 66 WFAN. Night game tomorrow, day game Thursday. Then the Diamondbacks in for four. And the Cardinals for two to fill out this 10-game homestand before the Mets go to San Diego and Arizona. Meanwhile, down in the bowels of the stadium, Kevin Burkhardt standing by with a very successful Mike Pelford. All right, Gary, Mike, you wanted a chance to go out there in the seventh there, didn't you? I did. Uh, I knew my pitch count was up. I looked at him. I, I tried to tell him uh, one more, but I, think, I didn't think they were going to. They were to take me out anyway. They told me, "Hey, if somebody uh, gets on, you're out." So, uh, you know, I tried to go out and, and execute pitches. You mentioned in Washington that you felt like that was the mic that was supposed to be there with the with the stuff, and also you you you, you threw 196 in that game. You said, "Oh, I, I had to show David where I could throw it hard." Well, you threw consistently that today. Was that a plan? Did you throw more four seam fastballs today? You know, I, th I think that I've kind of got I got I got a little bit away from using. Uh, you know my fastball I was using because my, I felt like my secondary stuff's gotten you know so much better. You know, so uh, you know I wanted to go back and, and reestablish uh, you know who I am, and that's most important with it, which is a you know power fastball guy. So uh, you know I felt good and uh, you know last start, and then you know I felt even better tonight. So how have you found the right mix the last few starts, Mike, to mix in to go to your secondary stuff, which as you say has been good. How have you found it, you know the mix and and finding a way to mix it up and still get that stuff in there? You know if I if I use my uh, you know fastball. Um, you know, my secondary stuff doesn't need to be as good, you know, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when guys, you know, guys throwing 94, 95, I mean, you have to, you have to respect that, you know. So, uh, you know, I just try to pick, pick my spots and, and, you know, rely on, you know, Brian, uh, you know, did a good job of calling the game to, uh, to uh, you know, win the throne. Do you, do you consider this still part of your growth? I mean, this, this seems like it's, you know, it's still a growing process for you. You're still trying to kind of get better and find yourself. Yeah, I, I do. You know, I feel like I've, I've, I've gotten better this year. I, I know the results aren't. Um, you know, as good as I would like, or uh, as, as as good as they were last year. You know, but I, I personally, I feel like I've gotten better, and I think that uh, you know I'm headed in the right direction. All right, before I let you go, take me through the two big situations. The bases loaded with Barmas up both times. Both times he pops up. What was your approach against him? Uh, well, we, I knew going in that, that he was aggressive. You know, so um, you know I tried to, I tried to, we started him off fastballs away. Uh, at least I think we mainly stuck with the fastball, uh, and you know we tried to climb climb ladder, and then. Um, you know, we, we came in on both those times. Uh, they got him and got him to pop up. Well, Mike, uh, certainly a fantastic effort, and good luck. Hopefully, the Mets can uh, sew this one up for you. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Mike Pelfrey, guys. Terrific tonight, and we thank him for the time. Back up to you. And we thank you, Kevin and Mike. And it's very interesting to me to hear Mike describe himself as a power fastball guy, since we always think of him as a power sinker guy. As Cora grounds went out to short, and Tulowitzki shows off his howitzer for the oh. second out. I've said I've said all the time, uh, Gary, that there's a fine line to taking backing off your fastball for more command, more movement. And a guy like Pelp when we saw in '96, he can make a mistake with a fastball with that kind of gas. I like Pelfrey throwing hard like that as opposed to backing off at '92, '91. Julius Chassin, the rookie right-hander, throws strike one to Jeremy Reed. Well, Chassin, of course, their number one prospect coming out of the minor leagues. When Manny Corpus, their reliever, had to have surgery to replace some bone, to take some bone chips out, opened a spot for Chassin. Dan O'Dowd, Dan O'Dowd, the general manager, said, you know what, we're going to put him in some middle innings kind of capacity, not too much pressure situations. But this is a young man that was 39-16 and 16 in the minor leagues as a starter. This is just his second big league appearance. He made his debut on Saturday. And here he is out for his second outing. Got a good heavy sinker like most of these Rocky pitchers do. A good change up. His breaking ball is coming around. Just 21 oh. years old and he misses low and away to Reed two and two. And Ionetta barely can catch that sinker. It just has beautiful movement down in the strike zone. Well this is what the Rockies have tried to do in deference to Coors Field. Build a staff of sinker ballers. They've got Aaron Cook, who's one of the preeminent sinker ball pitchers, Jason Marquis, who we saw here tonight. And they're trying to build their staff in that mold. So far, so good. Reed lifts one foul down the left field side. 
Jason Marquis went six innings, allowed seven hits, three runs, two of them earned, and walked in three strikeouts. Here's the answer to your off like trivia question. Two no-hitters against the Rockies, both by pitchers who pitched for the Mets. No, nice. no more and lighter. There you go. No more who pitched the first no-hitter at Coors Field and did it mostly pitching out of the stretch because it had rained for about two hours and he was afraid of slipping on the mound, which it makes it even more, more remarkable. remarkable. Yes, yep. absolutely. Because Nomo, his signature was that tornado windup. Reed just got a piece. Well, Mark Burley coming off a perfect game in his last start. Perfect through four tonight at Minnesota. Well, everyone's been asking who's going to pass Johnny Vandermeer with two no-hitters in a row. How about two perfect games in a row? Never been done. Never been done. Two high ball four and Reed's on with a two-out walk. So he's now retired 30 batters in a row. Now, I believe the record for starters is 31 in a row. The re record for relievers, uh, the overall record is 41. Jim Barr did that for the Giants. I faced Jim Barr, a USC grad. He drilled me once <laughs> on purpose. Are you over it yet? Excuse oh, yeah. me. It's, four, it's, it's 40 straight batters. Yeah, yeah, for 40 Burley. and 41. Right. So he's one shy of Barr's record. So two out and a runner at first. And Angel Pagan, who's gone 0 for 7 in this series now. 0 for 3 tonight with a couple of strikeouts. What do you do if you throw two perfect games in a row? Retire? Retire, exactly. Where are you going to go from there? <laughs> you make it no, you know what? to you, your own wing in Cooperstown. No, you make your next start, and as soon as you're not perfect, then you retire. That's it. Already has a no-hitter to his credit, so perfect game and a no-hitter for Burley in his career. And for you people out there, a guy who doesn't throw more than 84, 85 miles an hour. Pulled down to first, right by Helton and into right field. Reed will easily go to third. Pagan will hold on at first, and the Mets have runners at the corners with two down. A base hit for Pagan that uh, just went right on by Todd Helton. Well, this is a bullet right here, and the ball came up. Helton just... Had no chance to get in front. Nice swing by there, put on by Pagan. Helton, no uh, chance to get in front. You're right, Keith. That took a big hop. First hit of the series for Pagan. But that's what you were talking about before when Murphy came off the bag on the yep. double play. That Helton did not come off did the bag as aggressively. And the, Pagan is not a pull hitter, so that's a guy you'd want to come off. See, he should be oh, beyond the cut in that. Right there. You should straddle that when you come off the bat. And that would have hit him right in the middle of the body. Yeah, your body right in front of it. So now Castillo with first and third and two down. Louis already driven a run tonight with a third inning single. And Chassin throws the breaking ball down for ball one. Well, that's the first hit Julius Chassin has given up in the major leagues. Mets now have eight hits for the night. I've been told my telestrator is not working. Bummer. I have the worst luck with telestrators. It's Al Friedman, our cameraman. That's why he's in charge of that every day. Has Gets it right about, about a 200 hitter. Has the oh. warranty run out? There goes my monitor now. It's down. And now the third to first move, and he almost got Pagan leaning the wrong way. Well, Burley just got the first out of the bottom of the fifth, 41 in a row. That ties the major league record. Jim Barr and Bobby Jenks That's right. have tied that record. One and one to Castillo. Yeah, that's a little high. Two and one. And he just got Joe Creedy. 
He's now got the major league record 42 consecutive batters retired two out in the bottom of the fifth. That's amazing. Wow. Just a soft tossing lefty. There goes Pagan. The throw to second. Coming home now and into a one down is Jeremy Reed. What was he thinking? Terrible base running by Jeremy Reed as he gets tagged out to end the inning. Reed caught halfway in between. And that cost the Mets a chance in the seventh. Three nine. We go to the eighth inning here at City Field. Tonight after the postgame, it's 30 minutes of highlights, analysis, and in-depth coverage of all things New York sports on Geico Sports Night. Tonight after the postgame, added 1 a.m. right here on SNY. Now Pedro Feliciano struck out both batters he faced in the seventh. He'll stay on for the eighth with another left-hand hitter coming up, Brad Hopp, who's gone 0 for 3 tonight. That's with a 3-0 lead. Hop takes off the plate 2 0. Oh. It'll be Hop, then Troy Tulowitzki, and then Ian Stewart. So we'll see how Jerry works the inning. You've got left, right, left coming up. There's a strike oh. 2 and 1. To the right side where Murphy's there to grab it. Feliciano handles the low throw. One away. Well, let's go back to the bottom of the seventh inning, that last out. With Pagan breaking for second, Reed just kind of dances down the line, and I'm not sure what he was thinking. Well, he got caught going back, and that's a play, Garrett. You're trying to do the old double steal, and you either you have to take a chance and you break home once the catcher, you, you feel he's going to release the ball and then try to beat the throw home. Uh, it, it happened to me in St. Louis when I was very young. I did the same thing, and I even did it worse. I just didn't even move. I just froze, and it's just like you have a vapor lock. You know, what you have to do is uh, you try to understand the situation, though. Too important to run to let that run steal, so Tulowitzki is going to come off the bag and give the second base bag to Pagan. Secondly, Tulowitzki has a... Great, great arm. So there's no chance of you beating the throw to home plate unless he makes an errant throw. And third, and most importantly, you have one of your hottest hitters up at the plate, and you got a chance for an RBI situation, a couple more stakes, and the game semi out of reach. I, basi I, I basically would have put a hold on Pagan yeah. and leave the hole for Louie 
it's too big a run out there to drive in in a hot hitter. Good point. Right in front of it is Castillo. So Feliciano's retired the first two here in the eighth. Well, he's on a roll right now. He has been brilliant. Four up and four down for Feliciano, and now he'll go up against Ian Stewart, a left-hand hitter with two out and nobody on. Meanwhile, in Minnesota, Mark Burley, five perfect innings tonight. Unbelievable. This 43 consecutive batters retired. A new major league record. Wow. They're now, they're now the White Sox are batting in the top of the sixth in that game. By the way, it's scoreless. Tex Kai, Tivo. <laughs> I remember your buddy Dennis oh. Eckersley had a no hitter and then went to the seventh inning of his next start with a no. But this is perfection. Yeah. Imagine. I mean, if you have a start and you have pitch a complete game, and you go through the lineup four times, one, two, three, that's a great start. This is 14 in a row. Oh. oh and two to Stewart. And the breaking ball down, one and two. I got to get a foul tip off his I foot. I was going to say, injury, it, injury in the wiffle ball court? It'll be important. <laughs> He'll be in Port St. Lucie tomorrow doing that game. Too much <laughs> bending for that down for those balls. Two and two to Stewart. It's like Gulliver out there. <laughs> Frank or Frank Howard. <laughs> <laughs> in the old days, his nickname would be Stretch, wouldn't it? There are the wild card standings in the National League. If the Mets win tonight, they'll be just five and a half in back, and you've still got 63 games to play. So, what a season that appeared just about lost less than a week ago is, is anything but lost right now. And you've got Santana going tomorrow. Right. Thank heaven for a while for the wild card. 2 2. And Stewart down swinging, and what a performance by Feliciano. Five up and five down with three strikeouts for Perpetual Pedro. Now Castillo will get the turn and bat back in the bottom. Adjustments later in their careers. I, I don't know about you, Keith. I think it's uh, difficult for both uh, because for pitchers, usually it means making an adjustment because you don't have the same physical gifts. And I think the same goes for a hitter. Sometimes you slow up a little, so you got to be a little more intelligent at the plate, don't you think? Uh, it's a good question. Yeah, that's, really a tough one. that's the toughest one I've had. How yet? about this? Eddie from the Bronx. Maybe Very the good. easiest adjustment to make later in your career is as a fielder. Is that fair? Because you can cheat more, you get a little more yeah. knowledge about the hitters. Like and pull a Cal Ripken, right? Yeah, exactly. 
I would think that it would be tougher for a pitcher if he lost that little bit on his fastball that was necessary, and all. And he's got to, you know, retool he everything. Reinvent himself. I yeah, think, you're I, right. I would think it'd be more difficult for a pitcher. That's my opinion for what it's worth. Better Josh Fogg on to pitch. Luis Castillo takes ball one. Castillo was at the plate when Reed was tagged down between third and home on the busted double steal. Josh Fogg, who first came to the big leagues with the Chicago White Sox under Jerry Manuel in, in 2001. As Frankie Rodriguez gets up, Tim Reddick, who has uh, not worked in about two weeks, getting some work in down there. It's not like he hasn't been up, though. Castillo taking all the way, and it's 3 0. Well, the way the pattern's gone lately, when Frankie's gotten up in the bullpen, the Mets have gotten the extra run, and he hasn't had a save chance. Hey, listen, forget about saves. Score as many runs as you can. This is one where, as a team, like Louie walking there on four pitches, you really try to play for one run here, don't you, Keith? Yes. And I just hard to believe we're seeing what we saw last night a leadoff walk for Castillo. On four pitches last night, it was Rincon who just got himself in a whole bunch of trouble, walking three batters, one intentional. Fog does not appear to be as wild as Rincon was. He, he could not even locate the strike zone on the GPS. <laughs> Here's David Wright, who's got a single and a double. The double hit high off the fence, just under the apple in center field. Yelling on the bench right now, Ronnie. Should have got him out when he's up at the plate. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Throw the ball home, me. <laughs> Should have got him when he's up. That's one thing I'd like to get to Kevin because he's get from Kevin. He's always so close to that bench. You were down there that one time. Was there a lot of bench jockeying going on? Or no, no, no. no. They does that. Anymore. No, they don't. No, they all get too easily offended. It's a lot of fun, I'll tell you. It was. David with his two hits tonight has his average up to 323. Daniel Murphy on deck. May not be your conventional cleanup hitter, but the Mets have won ever since he moved into that cleanup spot. It's got great starting pitching tonight for Mike Pelfrey. And fine offensive execution. Two and one now to right. They got a huge double play started by Daniel Murphy. That took the Rockies out of a potentially huge inning in the fourth. And right now the Mets are doing just about everything right. Well, they're, they, were, they were due. Three and one now to David. So Clock digging a big hole for himself. Eight pitches, only one strike. Josh Fogg's been a starting pitcher for most of his career. Won as many as 12 games in a season with the Pirates back in 02. Falling behind and taking a long time to do it. Here's the three one to right. And it's outside ball four, so Fogg issues back-to-back -back walks to start the bottom of the eighth. Daniel Murphy coming up. First, we'll check in with Chris Carlin with the New York State Smokers quit line game break. Thanks, Chris. It will keep everybody up to date. Worley perfect through five. 43 consecutive batters retired. New major league record. Well, here we are with the same situation as last night, Gare. But it's a 3 nothing game instead of a tie ball game. So I've got to believe that Murph is going to be swinging the bat. But defensively, you've got to play it kind of 50-50. You can't take it for granted. But i got to believe he's swinging here. Well, he was swinging at the first pitch. Last night in a tie situation. And you can see right there Helton kind of in halfway. Third baseman not aggressively in. And I agree. I mean, if I was Hel Helton, I'd back up with the pitch. 
And they're and bunting. Bunting, and he fouls it off. Well, he laid down a beautiful bunt last night, right along the line, forcing the third baseman to handle it. Well, let's see if Jerry does the exact opposite here. Yeah, there Takes you go. the bunt off and lets him swing. There's a guy who's walked a couple. Might be thinking that Murphy is going to bunt again. Wants to get another strike over the middle of the plate. Might play into Murphy's power. Razor with the signs. Daniel has drilled a double, drawn a walk, and hit a long fly ball to center. One for two on the night. And he's set to swing and takes outside. I like it. In Minnesota, Burley's gone three and two to Carlos Gomez. Streak in jeopardy. And he got him on a foul ball to third base. 44 in a row. Carlos was swinging, by the way. Yeah. We've seen that. <laughs> Not the guy who draws a lot of walks. One and one to Murphy. And he drills one into center field for a base hit. Around third comes Castillo. Here comes Fowler's throw to the plate. Castillo sliding head first, and he's safe. Jim Tracy out to argue. The ball beat him there. Castillo comes in head first, and somehow is called safe, and the Mets lead 4 0. What a throw by the youngster. Oh boy, he blew that call. He's yep. certainly out. Tagged him right on that forearm. Not even close. Nice throw by Fowler. And he hit the cutoff man. And Jim it, Tracy and Larry Vanover really going at it now. I mean, that's not even close. Yeah. He's out for me to you. And the umpire is right there. Check it again. But I think Larry Vanover was in perfect position to see that. He was in perfect position. Saw it. I don't think he got blocked up by INL. Yeah, and there he goes. Jim Tracy. I don't blame him. Oh, he's got to get, get, get ejected there. That's a big run. I mean, Fowler made a terrific play. Castillo, I don't know why he decided to go in head first. You can really get hurt that way. And he was out. And that's where the managers are saying, you know what? You're throwing me out, and you blew the call. No. Where's life freeze cam? Confirms the tag on the forearm before Castillo got to the plate. Yep. He is out, clearly. He's not even touched the plate then at that point. That last frame we had there on that Coors Light freeze frame. And Mr. Fowler, by the way, has got, was rumored to have five tools. He's got him. What a throw. Well, Ooh. we saw him make a nice throw toward third base earlier in the game. I don't know what Vanover thought he saw. He's right there. So the Mets get a run out of it. Daniel Murphy with his second hit of the night. Drives in the run as Frank Kerr fouls one on. Oh, Burley's retired another one. It's 45 in a row now. Walks will kill. Mets taking advantage late in the both ball games in this series with leadoff and two walks to start the inning. He got a chance to blow it wide open here. Frank Kerr had an RBI single back in the second, by the way. No save chance again for K-Rod. Alexi Casilla has just walked for the Twins, and Burley's consecutive batter retired streak ends at 45, a new major league record. He still has the no-hitter intact, though, with two out of the six. Well, there's the the bruised hand of Frank Cole. And Frank Kerr down swinging for the first out of the inning. Well, someone got wise and didn't throw him a strike, Ronnie. <laughs> so one out. And now Fernando Tatis will bat for the pitcher Feliciano. What a job Pedro did in relief. Outstanding. Denard Spann just got a base hit off Mark Burley. And so his bid to match Johnny Vandermeer goes by the board. Well, Tatis up with only two men on tonight. After his pinch hit grand slam, broke a 3-3 tie in the eighth last night. And he takes a loan away from Fogg. In what has been a very difficult season for Fernando, last night was a huge ray of light. 
and, and you hope it can keep him going now that he has a role on the bench and he can become that good pinch hitter he was in last season. Pops it up foul. And out of play 1-1. One, one. Well, it was a very good interview that uh, Kevin had last night with Tatis. And we've been noticing for the longest time that Tatis was over swinging, Ronnie. Yeah. He's taking big, too big a cuts. And he said last night, I shortened up, just wanted to hit a fly ball, and he didn't overswing. So hopefully he can incorporate that on a, you know, when he has every opportunity to pinch hit or he gets to play. See, Sean Green's replaced Frankie Rodriguez in the bullpen with the save opportunity gone. Throw to second and just back in time is David Wright. Looks like David got, uh, took a bad step there trying to get back. Yeah, you're right about that. He was in between the hop, really, taking that lead. Almost got caught. Good time to steal now, though. They don't throw there twice in a row. Oh, he fakes it, but he didn't go. He took a couple of running strides toward third, but David then thought better of it. Brian Schneider on deck. That's with single runs in the second, third, fourth, and eighth. And a 4 nothing lead as they bid for their fourth straight win. Trying to get back to within three games of the 500 mark. Boy, Fog's taking a long time. It really time. is. By the way, what kind of game has Daniel Murphy had, right? Outstanding. Single, double, walk. Productive fly ball out, and then started that key double play in the fourth. Two and two now to Tatis. Full count to Tatis. Well, they'll be running now. 3 2 count, exactly what Fogg didn't want to do. Perfect for the Mets. Stay out of the double play. Get something in the gap. It's an automatic two. Good at bat here for Tatis after falling behind. Not going, and Tatis pops one up and Right near first base, Helton is there. Infield fly called for the second out. So two out and two on. Brian Schneider coming up. Let's go right back to the studio. Chris Carlin, New York State Smokers Quidline Game Break. The way it always goes. He's hit a wall. <laughs> yeah, big game gone, no hitter gone, yeah. shutout yes. gone, lead gone. Yep. It's all in a matter of moments. Brian Schneider 0 for 2, drove in a run with a sacrifice fly back in the fourth. Two on and two out, and Schneider takes at the knees for ball one, for a strike one. I was pitching a game in Kansas City, no hitter through seven. Keith Miller, our Keith Miller from the Mets, came up, hit a ground ball single up the middle. Replaced me with Rick Honeycutt. He threw wild to first base. He scored from first. Everything done. No hitter gone. Wow. Shout out gone. Royals 1 1 and nothing. Game over. Now you see Honeycutt every now and again. You ever remind him of that? He did a lot of great things for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> Honeycutt was a good pitcher. He was. Well, he scuffed that ball big time. <laughs> he, he was a scuffer. What was he using? A thumbtack or uh, something? He. He had tremendous movement on his fastball. You think pitchers still stuff balls, or is it harder to do now with all the pervasive television? Yeah, it's hard. It's harder to do, absolutely. And plus, you used to be able to use a ball that was 
uh, used in the infield, the ball you threw in the dirt, you get it back sometimes, look at it, and you have a little scuff, you can use it. They don't. They throw every ball that hits the uh, ground out of play. Another conspiracy against pitchers. There you go. Well, Gaylord Perry, Mike Scott, they come to mind. That one gets away from Ionetta, can't find it. The runners move to second and third. Fog tries to throw a change up there, and that's no, you don't want a backhand. Your kids watching, you're a catcher. You want to keep that glove face facing the pitcher and get that body down and block it. You know what that is, Keith? That's a muggy night, eighth inning, tired catcher. So, two in scoring position now for Schneider, who has a three and one count. And he walked him to load the bases. Third walk of the inning for Josh Fogg. Well, here comes Bob Apodaca, the pitching coach for the Colorado Rockies. Just tell me an interesting story today. He said when he first came to the major leagues, he was in spring training and you know he had a long day and he got showered and got in his car and he looked out and he saw Tom Seaver taking ground balls with Buddy Harrelson. Did the same thing the next day and he saw Seaver playing pepper with Buddy. Next day he leaves again. He sees Seaver out there working on his bunny. And he said, "You know what? No wonder he's so good. The <laughs> guy's out there a whole day long." And he asked him. He said, "Boy, don't you ever get tired?" He said, "Of course I'm tired, but I know I can get better." That's what made the That's franchise so good. Leading by example, too, isn't it? Yes, it, it is. Bob Apodaca is a very useful relief pitcher for the Mets in the mid '70s. So here's Alex Cora with the bases loaded in two down. By the way, Garrett Anderson just homered to the top of the ninth for Atlanta to put them up 3 2 on the Marlins. Get it off Leo Nunez. And Cora takes a strike. Alex, two for three tonight. Single to left, single to right. Tried to stretch that second base hit into a double. And was thrown out by Brad Hopp. Hit to center field. And Fowler is there. And that ends the inning. Well, the Mets get a run that they didn't really deserve. Daniel Murphy singling home Luis Castillo, who certainly appeared to be out at the plate. But the Mets will take it. And now they lead four. By IOTV, get the best in HD free with IOTV. By Geico. By New York Community Banks. By the United States Postal Service. By Lexus. And by Smirnoff. Sean Green will try and finish it up for New York. Well, Sean Green got his first save as a Met on Sunday at Houston, an inning and third with a couple of hits and a strikeout. As he tries to clean up this ninth inning for the Mets. Mike Pelfrey went the first six and a third. No runs, seven hits, three walks, five strikeouts. Pedro Feliciano, five up and five down with three strikeouts in his inning at two thirds. 
Mets bidding for their seventh shutout victory of the season. And leading 4-0 as we start the ninth. Lower third of the order. Chris Iannetta, Clint Barmas, and Ryan Spilborgs, the three scheduled hitters. By the way, it's got to feel awfully nice for this Mets team to be on the other side of the shutout deal. Well, what's also very interesting is now you look at these two series the Mets have played in Houston and now here. You had two incredibly hot teams, the Astros and the Rockies, who had been tearing up the league for the better part of two months. And the Mets pulled off the Astros over the weekend and tried to do the same against Colorado. Well, it's just interesting when you start. When you start getting hot, you get the breaks. The Mets went in there to Houston, didn't get Oswald and Wandy Rodriguez. David Wright into field. Ionetta's ground ball for the first time. They got the back three of the Houston rotation. It just worked out that way. And, you know, when you get on a roll, you just start getting those little breaks and then when things turn around. Well, coming up right after we are done here, it's Chris Carlin, Bobby Ojeda. With all of tonight's exclusive interviews, highlights, Jerry's post-game reaction, we'll hear more from Mike Pelfrey about his outstanding effort, all on Lincoln Mercury post-game live, and there they are. Boy, they work hard, don't they? Right after tonight's game, and after all 162 Mets games, right here on SNY. I'm glad to see somebody can have some fun during the game. <laughs> Right. Well, is it like that when you're in the studio? Uh, no, no one uh, ever wants to uh, play cards when I'm there. It's because you cheat. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not trying if you're not cheating. And Barmas gets hit. <laughs> Second batter that's been hit for the Rockies tonight. A bitter irony for Mr. Barmas, right? Base is loaded a couple times. Could not get anyone in here, no one on base, and gets hit by a pitch. Second met batsman hit. No, I'm sorry, there are two bats now they're even. Well, Ionetta got hit in the sixth, and then Frank Kerr got hit in the bottom of the sixth, and now Barmas gets hit here in the ninth. So there's three hit batsmen tonight. So here's Spielborg's up for the second time. Took a call third strike as a pinch hitter in the seventh and stayed in in left field. Well, let me ask you guys, uh, I did not make the trip. You saw Atlanta, you saw Houston. You Washington. saw some hot Washington. Here you see the Colorado Rockies, another hot team like Houston. My contention is, and this would be the biggest reason the Mets feel like they're in it, and they're getting five and a half on the wild card, is that the Dodgers are a good team. The Phillies are a strong team. Maybe with Holiday and DeRosa, the Cardinals have become a strong team. Other than that, everyone's the same. Yeah, I think the Cubs have the potential. There you to go. Be. Okay, Cubs. Are, and I think that that's the one thing you have to worry about yeah. more than anything else that the Cardinals and Cubs start doing the Yankee Red Sox thing, go. where they both start winning. You're right. And that would make it difficult for the Mets. Well, that's what happens when you have you know multiple teams in front of you. Right. You don't have to. You not only have to get to the first place team, you got to get ahead of the five, six yeah. teams ahead of you, and are they all going to go bad at the same time? It makes it very tough. Well, you know what you need to do. I mean, the Mets have won three straight. They have a chance tonight to win four straight. you got to rip off a 14 out of 15, yeah. and then that takes care of Ex itself. Exactly. Right. And the scheduling worked out nicely where they're getting hot, and they've got the leader here for four games, not yeah. a three-game series. Yeah. Three and one, and a swing and a miss by Spielberg's three and two. And I get you guys. Going through all those teams is difficult, but I will say what my point is, as you see Sean Green with that little sinker, is that even though this team's ahead of you, it's not like these teams are all fantastic. Right. They're all teams that could play 500 in a heartbeat for an extended period of time. There's too many games left. It's one game at a time. Well, the Rockies lead the wild card chase, and they're only nine games over 500. That's right. Tomorrow night, game three of this series, Johan Santana makes another bid at his 12th victory of the season. Jason Hamill goes for the Rockies. 6.30 the coverage, KFC pregame live tomorrow night on SNY. Then don't forget a noontime start on Thursday. One of uh, two on this homestand. Thursday is a noontime start. And the next Wednesday against the Cardinals, also a noontime start. That's to get us out to San Diego. I'm going to just not. make sure that you guys can get here on time. Well, you I'm not worried about. You? I'm missing. Well, you're not working either one of those I don't games? I believe I am. Sleeping in? You just don't work the I day can't. game after a night game now? Well, it's in the contract. <laughs> 
Well, we'll be lucky if Keith's awake early enough to watch us at noon. Now, Forget about getting to the ballpark on time. That next Wednesday, Thursday may be that. Are those starting to get those camp days where yeah, all the kids come right. in? These are the two camp days that they have every summer. Ninth pitch of the at-bat to Spielborgs, and he grounds one back to Green. Out at second, out at first, and the ball game is over. Mike Pelfrey and the bullpen combine on a shutout. The Mets' seventh shutout victory of the season. 